and welcome to a brand new life, to a brand new day, all the way from the wastelands of California. My name is Michael, and I am a mere figment of your imagination. I look forward to once again serve you those sounds of salvation. First time listeners, turn on, tune in, and drop out. This is a very different kind of show, a place where we don't feel so alone. Let us chase away the light no matter what you at home choose to believe. I do admire you for your curiosity. Live and direct right now on YouTube and the TuneIn Radio app. You can find the podcast rendition of this program by searching End of Days on all popular media platforms. Tonight I have a very special edition of the Michael Deacon program just for you. I will be joined by Mike Rogers, Kevin Randall, and Peter Robbins to discuss a plethora of topics such as Area 51. What is going to happen on that warm day in September 20th? Also, were actual ET bodies discovered in Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947? We will also be discussing the Phoenix Lights incident, plus a whole lot more. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me into your hearts and into your minds. Here we are again on a night like this. Thank you to those in America for supporting the program and those outside of America for all your support. And what a week it's been, boys and girls. Tonight will be fun. That number is 760-332-8724. One more time, 760-332-8724. Now let's not waste any more time and let's bring in uh, our guest. Gentlemen, what's going on? We are live now. Yes, and I'm sorry to jump in here and crash the fun yes yes no problem so i do want to welcome you fine gentlemen to the program thank you so much for spending some of your time with me here oh yes and of course i want to say i'm so glad we're doing this and all of this was of course because of mr mike rogers yeah he really helped us through here yeah you did oh gentlemen we are having trouble here already yes it seems like the audience cannot hear you I know that's, that's terrible. It, it must be. I'm not quite sure what the hell just happened here. I mean, everything was working fine a minute ago. See, that's what, yes. <laughs> yes, the audience can only hear me talking to myself here, which is always amusing. But, but I mean, at least they're used to it, though. They're used to it. They know what happens here, especially when you're testing out new equipment. Not everything goes as planned. <laughs> I know, right? Well, don't worry. I know they're on to me. They think I'm lying. You did. You said it was going to be a fun show, and, and you're right. Wow. Well, don't worry. I'm fixing it. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm doing that now. And it says here in the chat room, I don't think Mike even booked the guest, and this is all a scam. <laughs> I know. I, I'm only talking to myself uh, for my own amusement here. <laughs> I, I'm amused, too. I like it. It is. They could actually hear me right now talking to myself. I, I'm, you know, I can't complain. I'm having a great time here. No, he's really talking to me, people. I'm not just um, talking to myself here. I know this is all a figment of their imagination, too. But I think I know what, what, what's going on here. I think I might have fixed it. The switch to pull. <laughs> and I think maybe that might have worked. Can they hear us now? I think they can. Can they hear me? Yeah, I think they could hear you now. Marvelous. There they are. That's what they're saying. All right. Hey. Yes, I apologize. It's just when you're testing out new equipment, uh, some things are just not going to work right. <laughs> but goddamn, yeah. do we sound great now. Wow. <laughs> That's a major difference. Everyone sounds amazing on this thing. Yes, well. but, yes, gentlemen. But of course, I do want to thank all of you for being here and of course, hanging out with me, getting through all these audio issues and we walk through them like a, like a breeze. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. But yes, gentlemen, again, I'm so glad you're all here. And thanks to Mr. Mike Rogers for putting this together. Mm -hmm. He's a good guy. And yeah. <laughs> of course, yes, sir. And of course, I do want to go around here during this discussion and sort of have everyone introduce themselves and tell the audience a little bit about themselves before we kick this off. And of course, Mike, I want you to start this off. Tell us about yourself before we get the ball rolling here. All right. Well... I'm Mike Rogers. I was uh, Travis Walton's crew boss back in 1975. That's kind of the start of all this. But uh, 
recently, uh, in fact, in uh, 1997, I uh, saw the, uh, I was witness to the uh, Phoenix Lights. I was in uh, Prescott at the time, and that's what this is all about, really. Uh, and uh, we'll get into that as we go, but uh, how much, you don't want any more of me, do you? You want to go ahead and go to Kevin and Peter? Yeah, we can go to Kevin and Peter. All right. Yeah, Kevin, go ahead. I'm Kevin Randall. I'm a retired lieutenant colonel from the U.S. Army, spent a tour as a helicopter pilot in Vietnam and a tour as an intelligence officer in Iraq. I've been studying UFOs since I was in high school. I've written a number of books about it, including Roswell in the 21st Century and one about Socorro called Encounter in the Desert. And uh, if you name a UFO case, I'd probably talk to somebody who was involved in it. And, and I was thinking about that the other day. Mm. Uh, looking at some of the notes, and I was just amazed at the the people I could mention. Uh, take the Washington Nationals, for example. Al Chop and Dewey Fournay were two of the government officials in the radar room during those sightings. I talked to both of those a number mm. of years ago. So, you know, I've, I've got this, um, I guess, this library of information that I've collected over, oh, I don't want to say it because it's way too many years, 50 <laughs> years or so about UFOs, and it goes back into the uh, into the 1960s and continues on until today. I've spent a lot of time in Roswell looking at that sort of thing. Um, also uh, have a couple of college degrees and uh, things like that. So my experiences are kind of eclectic, I guess. Very nice. And of course, that leaves us with you, Mr. Peter Robbins. Go ahead. Uh, yes, my name is Peter Robbins. I'm an investigative writer who has specialized in the subject of UFOs and mysteries in history for some decades. My original training and career path was as a painter, a New York City-based artist who taught at my old alma mater, the School of Visual Arts, for many years until I became quite obsessed with the subject of UFOs. Um, I would say overnight, but it happened quicker uh, with the return of a childhood memory of a profound UFO sighting that was quite too much for me to handle at the time, but when I memory did return about 15 years later, I discussed it with the witness that I saw it with, my late sister Helen, whose memory matched mine, and she was the first person who talked to me about what we would now call an archetypical UFO abduction. Uh, at the time, I had never heard anything like it. Um, I went on to work as the longtime assistant for many years to Bud Hopkins, arguably the uh, father of the scientific study of abduction, uh, gone on to write several books. And um, some people know me um, primarily through my longtime research on Great Britain's best known case, uh, the Rendlesham Forest UFO incident. Right. Uh, my contributions of which blew up on a certain level about three years ago with the discovery and the exposure of my former co-author as um, a wannabe, a, uh, somebody who injected himself into the story, who created his role in it. Rendlesham was a very real event, but uh, my co-author's account of it was in great part fictional. Yes, and that's uh, something I do want which, to, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but that's sure. something that I do want to discuss with you as we go along. Sure. And also, Peter, I want to say I'm very sorry about your sister. I know you were very close to her, and I know she meant a lot to you. Yeah. It's Yes, I, every time I hear you talk about her, I, I feel bad. Well, thank you. Um, I uh, was indeed very close to my sister. She was a good friend, a close colleague, um, a roommate at different times, a fellow artist, uh, a brilliant singer-songwriter, and um, one of the kindest and most thoughtful people I know. But when she passed, um, it was devastating to me. I mourn very fully. And then, as we should do, honor the memories of those who have gone before us by getting back to the business of living. Um, with gusto and with recommitment to do the best we can as people and as professionals. Amazing. And of course, we can all agree for the most part that we are vastly different from one another. However, we do have some common ground here. Yes. Definitely. We're not too far off. <laughs> Just a little bit. And I think we've all had some sort of sighting in our lives. Is that, is that correct? Have, have all of you seen something? Mike, you don't need to uh, answer that. Oh, Mike, I guess. Start. <laughs> well, everybody knows uh, what I've 
<laughs> with this one <laughs> and all, except for the Phoenix Lights. I'm just now bringing that out. Um, Kevin, have you had an experience? I always say, uh, well, I like to say no because the sighting that I had was really crappy. <laughs> uh, back when I was a teenager in high school, I was a member of the Denver UFO Society, and we were having a meeting, a camp out, a cookout in Castle Rock, Colorado. And we're sitting around the campfire, and we watched a light cross the sky from north to south, got directly overhead, flashed once, and continued on. I mean, just a point of light moving across the sky. A friend of mine, Eric Novotny, and I, when we got back to, to Denver, uh, tried to check the orbital patterns of various satellites, because at the time, there weren't that many satellites up. And there was nothing that was in a polar orbit at the time where we would have seen it going from north to south. So, you know, it's just light moving across the sky, and... I can't really attribute much of anything to it other than it was a light moving across the sky. Understood. Understood. And again, I want to thank all three of you for being here. This is going to be fun. And I want to, I want to quickly say uh, to all of you that this is an open discussion. We can all agree uh, to disagree with each other. That's, that's completely fine here. That's what makes things fun. Yeah, it is. Oh, yes. So let, let's begin, my friends. I thought a great place to start this off is to jump right into uh, not just the Phoenix Lights yet. I, I do want to save that for a little later as we go along here. I want to kind of save that for the main event, as they say. Uh, there's another event that's taking place that may or may not happen. And that, of course, is the so-called invasion of Area 51, started by that mm -hmm. Facebook group. I thought we could sort of just go there and take care of this issue mm -hmm. Uh, right away, since this is such a popular topic. <laughs> yeah, it is. All, all over the news. All over the place, all over the place. And of course, this started off as a joke, and it caught the attention of the feds. And I think we all have enough common sense amongst all of us here to agree that that idea is insane. Yes, it is. <laughs> My <laughs> goodness. Yes. Yeah, something that started as a joke could turn out to be very, very serious. Yeah, the military you know, won't joke around. The no. internet is such a double-edged sword. It has opened the world of information on literally any subject and nuance to everybody who has access to it. At the same time, especially in such a uh, unregulated, often sensationalized, distorted, misunderstood, exaggerated field such as serious UFO studies, it can play havoc with the truth. And when I first heard this, um, put forward, my first thought, some of you may remember, back at the halcyon days of the later 60s, at the height of the anti-war movement, um, when I was protesting in the streets, when Kevin was in Vietnam, um, there was this, let's all hold hands around the Pentagon and meditate, and it will rise in the air. I give uh, this invasion of Area 51 about the same credibility, and also, having been out to the area, um, I recall one of my favorite facts is Area 51 is the size of the country of Holland. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, very big. And if you've ever come up close to the perimeter and read the signs, which one should take seriously, um, this is for me an ultimate kind of silly flight of fantasy. Um, it's not going anywhere I would be willing to pay hard cash on. And, you know, it's it's spinning some wheels right now and taking a little bit of attention away from more serious subjects, and I guess we'll see what happens. Yes. And the one thing you have to remember is the uh, deadly force that force is authorized. Yeah. And people seem serious. to forget that because I've always believed what's going on in Area 51 is the development of the next generation of military aircraft, that it really has nothing to do with aliens or alien technology. Yeah. But that sort of thing would be, uh, <laughs> we don't want to see compromise to our competitors in the world. And I think yeah. the, the Air Force and the government would take any type of a, a threat to encroach on their, uh, uh, on Area 51 very, very seriously. And the, the best you could hope for was just spending some time in jail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, the best you could hope for, yes. You know, my thinking is that uh, those, those people are going to be there in such numbers that, that there is invariably going to be a group within the group that will decide to go ahead to show off and, mm. and uh, intrude, <laughs> and some people are going to die. That's what I think. Mm. 
And that's a possibility. Yeah. Like I said, it's a joke for some, but yeah. other individuals out there are taking this really seriously. Yeah. Well, at least they say they are. I, I well, think that's right true. now, it, in the great American tradition of becoming well-known very quickly, inject yourself into a hyper-controversial situation. True. You know, anything short of what I would call the Oswald syndrome. You want to become famous in America? Shoot somebody famous, and you're famous. This will not be that. But yes, there will be those types who, you know, play footsie and, you know, one step over the line kind of thing. But I don't think anybody really has a serious intention here. Um, I think it's basically, again, it's it's more publicity in the moment. Area 51 is now in the lexicon, whether or not you're involved in UFO studies. If you've ever watched, you know, um, uh, popular television or ancient astronauts or probably even mentioned on the old X-Files, it's part of the culture. And, gee, you know, I'm a little bored. I, I think I'll become part of this movement and see where it goes. You don't Again, really, I could be wrong. You don't really even need to shoot anyone to become famous nowadays. You could even sell your own bathwater and become a star. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well said. Well said. Uh, there, well, there's some people that have done that already. There's, uh, this is something I always say on my show that it's not against the law to profit off of others' ignorances. Mm. Not that uh, sink through. That. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. It depends on how you mean that. Well, <laughs> I'm going to explain more about that as we continue this conversation. <laughs> No doubt. And of course, I'm so glad we can agree with that, that storming Area 51 would uh, be terrible, a bad, bad idea. Yeah. But of course I do. I, I definitely will bring out the popcorn. However, once that uh, date comes, September 20th, I definitely <laughs> want to see a live stream and see what goes down if anyone actually shows up and mm. tries to breach the parameters. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I'm somebody will. It's it's like a car accident, you know. You can't help but want to look. Uh, sad but true. I'm only American. <laughs> We're all American, of course. That that's for the international listeners. Uh, yeah, yes. Guten Morgen to the German <laughs> listeners out there. Love them. They are a wild bunch. And of course, I'm glad we can all agree here. And and since we are talking about Area 51, I think now we can sort of work our way through the Phoenix Lights in incident slowly here. But before we even reach that point, we will be heading towards July 1947. And this is where we talk to you, Kevin, who you, you've talked about Area 51 uh, for such a long time. I believe you've even talked to Mr. Schmidt uh, about it as well, who's also someone who's very predominant uh, about the whole Area 51 Roswell incident. Well, Don and I worked together for quite a while. Right. Oh, yeah. On the yes. Roswell investigation. And I, I mean, I've been out to Area 51. I went out there with Robert Bigelow, mm. which I hesitate to say in today's environment. Did you really? <laughs> he, um, I didn't know he that. He bought the Kentucky Fried Chicken. Wow. So we had a picnic out there. We sat around out there. We watched lights fly in and out of the place and got close to it, visited the little alien and all of that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. But I've always felt, uh, Bob Lazar notwithstanding, that what is going on there is predominantly military research and development. Yeah. And and there really is no alien component there. Um, when Don and I were trying to find out what happened to the materials collected at Roswell, you know, we could we found out stories about the stuff being taken to Wright Patterson Air Force Base, Wright Field. We found uh, stories. General Exxon told us one of the bodies had been taken to Lowry Air Force Base in Denver because at the time Lowry had a mortuary service there and they were worried about the preservation of the of the um, the tissues and all of that sort of thing. But we really not we really didn't get anything about Area 51. And according to the research I've done, Area 51 didn't even come into prominence until the mid 1950s. Mm. There was some discussion about it earlier, but it was a um, a training site, and it was a, uh, I think, a um, bombing range for a while there in the early 1950s in, the, in that area. There was, really wasn't anything going on until they uh, started the building in, in 1950, I think 1954 was, was the date. There's some discussion of a, of a, uh, a map reference to Area 51, but it, it refers to uh, the aeronautical charts. And if you look at aeronautical charts, you know, the restricted areas and all of that is numbered. And I think the 
the restricted area around there was, of course, 51, so it became Area 51. But I haven't ever seen anything that was convincing to me, and I'll, I'll phrase it that way, convincing to me that there was anything alien or extraterrestrial going on there. Well, I wouldn't know. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. I have to say, uh, for my part, the answer that I find myself giving the most over the years when hyper-specific questions on such sensational um, possibilities are put forward to me is, I don't know. I don't know. And I have to question, at times, people who absolutely are adamant that they do know, especially if it's a very exotic response. Um, there's little question in my mind that it was certainly developed as a research and development area. Uh, you think about the great Kelly Johnson, the premier military aircraft designer of the 20th century, responsible for the U-2, the SR-71, et cetera. Um, one would need hyper-secrecy to develop such advanced technology in the most private uh, contained way possible. Um, whether or not there is this exotic component, I, I leave to colleagues, I just don't know, and I'm speculating on it. Well, that's a good answer. It contains a lot of people, but for me, no. Let's go on to something that we can wrap ourselves around properly and, and make informed speculation about. Yes, it's very interesting, the whole 1947 uh, incident and as everyone here, I'm sure, is quite familiar, especially those listening. And it is interesting to note that in the summer of 1947, the first week, I uh, saw numerous flying saucers, each time making the headline news. Pretty unusual. Yeah, I was born in 1947. Uh-oh. Well, well I'm, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure it has nothing to do with aliens. I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> uh -uh. But this is one of those cases that are classic that uh, so many people still talk about, even till this day, since we're doing it now. Yeah, but I, you have to remember that Area 51 really has no relevance to the Roswell case or 1947 because it didn't right. exist at that time. That's right. Very and true. the other thing you have to remember is that the, you had two weeks in June and July of 1947 from the point that Kenneth Arnold made his sighting on June 24th yep. to the announcement from the Roswell Army Airfield that they'd captured a flying saucer to the very next day, July 9th, 1947, where the Army and Navy moved to stop stories of flying saucers whizzing through the atmosphere. And you have to ask yourself, why was it for the two weeks they didn't care what the newspapers printed, they didn't care about the stories being circulated, mm -hmm. and then suddenly on July 9th, they start putting out this information that they, they're attempting to suppress the stories. Yeah. So you've got a lot of stuff going on in 1947. Oh yeah. That, uh, is, is suggestive of the military, the government, not knowing what's going on. They don't That's understand right. what the flying saucers are. They don't understand what people are seeing. They're very concerned by the number of military pilots and civilian pilots and military personnel who are observing these things, and they're thinking of those sightings with the military and law enforcement as mm -hmm. being made by credible witnesses, and they don't really have any answers. And so you've got a, a, an awful lot of stuff going on in the summer of 1947 that now is sort of subtly is carried over until we get to the point now where we're talking about storming Area 51 to find <laughs> out what was happening. Uh, I, I think there's better places to go look for the information, uh, especially where they're not going to threaten you with um, deadly force. That's so, very true. Well, you've One got to look things. at all of that sort of thing. Yeah, I, well, I wanna... I'll go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to put forward one thought, which is, um, as a bit of a history nerd, um, it, it it's worth noting, and I, I don't think there's anything ominous or, uh, you know, um, engineered about this, so to say. I think it is a genuine coincidence. In the summer of 1947, in July, the prestigious uh, publication Foreign Affairs, still in business, published an article um, by a... Um, uh, political um, theorist um, who published the article under the pseudonym of X. The article was called On Containment. And in this article, uh, this individual put forward a theory based on the understanding, and everybody knew in the summer of 1947, that although America's contribution to World War II 
had been important and it helped save the world from fascism, um, we now were face to face with our next mortal enemy, the Soviet Union uh, under Joseph Stalin. And that things could erupt in a World War III. And this gentleman, whose real name was George Kennan, who lived to be over 100 years old and went on to become an advisor to, I believe, nine United States presidents, I think Truman through Clinton, he put forward a theory that if we could hold the Soviets within the borders they had expanded to by the summer of 1945, we might avoid a shooting or hot war. If we could hold them within, we'll call it an iron curtain, it might become a war of attrition or a cold war. My point being that the modern age of UFOs, flying saucers, and the Cold War literally began at the same moment in the same month in American history. And I know, as Kevin can attest, as somebody who is a scholar and has reviewed thousands of authentic declassified documents, there were times over the next 45 years when a genuine UFO incident or incursion could be played as a possible Soviet situation, or when a Soviet incursion came, that it could be put forward as, gee, another UFO sighting. And it was part of the system that worked until the Soviet Union unwound in 1989, 1990, and the world changed again. It's just a footnote to that moment in 1947 that, for me, makes it the most interesting year of the 20th century in American history, right below the surface of official history. Would you like me to pop that bubble for you? Please. <laughs> Go um, ahead. In December of 1946, Colonel Howard McCoy was an um, intelligence officer at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Wright Field, working on, um, had been ordered to look into things like the Foo Fighters. He'd been involved in the Foo Fighter uh, uh, research during World War II. That was the sure. Foo Fighters being these objects that were seen by everybody. Uh, yeah. The Allies thought it was a German secret weapon or a Japanese <laughs> secret weapon, and, and they thought it was our secret weapons. Right. He was involved in that. And then there were the Ghost Rockets of 1946, which... Scandinavia. In uh, Sweden, in that, that area. They didn't really understand what it is. I don't think they have a good answer today. They thought originally it might have been something the Soviets were doing to in intimidate the, the Swedish. But uh, beginning in that era, they start collecting these stories of things flying around like that. And in December of 1946, Howard McCoy is told to begin an unofficial investigation into the UFOs. And he's collecting data uh, from that time. There was a sighting in Richmond, Virginia, I think it was, by weather personnel in April, April of 1947, they got a lot of play that that information really doesn't show up in the Project Blue Book files, but it was kind of the thing that, that McCoy was uh, gathering at the time. So we have a history of UFOs, Foo Fighters, Ghost Rockets, whatever, mm, right. starting, starting during World War II and moving on. For some reason, and, and this might fit in with what I believe it was Peter was saying, Yeah. Um, it started, it, it, I've never understood why the Arnold sighting took on the importance it did. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it the stuff is being investigated, it's being talked about at the highest levels, they're looking for this sort of thing, and then suddenly uh, everybody goes nuts after Arnold makes his sighting in June of 1947. I, I don't understand why that happened or how that came about, but that kind of fits in a little bit. So I didn't really pop your bubble. I just kind of expanded it, I think. No, no, uh, a very fine point. I'll tell you why I think that the Arnold sighting triggered it. Uh, within a day or two, as I recall, prior to Kenneth Arnold making his observation, landing at a regional airport, uh, a civilian aircraft, had gone down in um, that part of Washington state, and there was active searching for it. So there were news people at this airport. He lands, he gives his report. He's asked to describe what these objects look like and how they behave. And in one of those moments in history where somebody chooses a phrase and it sticks and has tremendous impact, he described them like saucers skimming across the water like when you're kids and you skim flat stones. Uh, the news media, um, being what they are, the term saucer uh, stuck and became immediately a point and reference of humor, a flying saucer. Please, how, how silly is that? 
And that captured a certain amount of the popular imagination. And again, this story broke immediately. It was news. The wire services picked up on it within 24 hours. And then, of course, the other end of the bookend was the report uh, two weeks later about Roswell. I think that may have been the reason, Kevin, simply that choice of words at that moment with the news media listening and picking up on it and putting the story out there publicly where the ghost rockets as well as um, the Foo Fighters, yes, people knew about to a certain degree, but this exploded it in the public imagination. At least that's my, my subjective thought on it. Yes, I would, it's wild I would that, just say... It's wild that you say that, by the way. History seems to be repeating itself. And go ahead, Kevin. I, would, I was just going to say, I thought that Arnold was looking for a Marine aircraft that had crashed some six months earlier, hmm. and there was a reward for anybody who could spot it. I think they ah. eventually found it on Mount Rainier. But there was a reason for that. So he was, he, that's why he was kind of looking for it on, on his trip. He was a businessman sure. in Boise, right. Idaho, that yep. flew from point to point in his in his region. So I think that's why he was there. But I, I given given the timing, I'm not sure that there would have been hmm. a lot of newsmen running around looking uh, for information about this plane crash that had taken taken place some months earlier. Uh, I've never understood. You know, if Arnold said, "Well, I found the airplane," that would have been one thing he could <laughs> would have been there to talk to him about it. But I just I just never understood why the press met him in. Uh, and I forget the name of the little town where he, he yeah. landed. The Yakima, Washington. I'm sorry, Yakima, Washington. I've never understood why the press was there and how the story got out from that point. It just didn't seem like there was anything for him to talk about. There's, you go back and look at the newspapers, and a lot of the stories there were people talking about having seen these things prior to Arnold. Um, Blue Book has a number of sightings from early June and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. people seeing that. The problem is nobody really came forward with the stories until after Arnold's story broke, and they said, yeah, I saw something too, with the exception of this uh, sighting from, from Richmond, Virginia, mm. which seemed to have been communicated amongst the intelligence community uh, in the military. Mm. Um, and it, because the, the fellow who told the story was surprised when he started getting phone calls from uh, military personnel asking him about what he had seen. And mm. the only reference to this sighting in the Project Blue Book files that I can find, I think is in the Grudge Report, and it's mentioned in there as mm. one of the sightings, but there's no mm -hmm. documentation in the files for it. The other thing, the other thing is the information about the Foo Fighters, not the Foo Fighters, the uh, Ghost Rockets mm. had disappeared from the files because McCoy was gathering the information. He had it at right field, and none of that information made it into the Project Blue Book files. Interesting. Very I'm going to have to recheck that. It may well be that that crash from six months earlier, there was still active searching, and that a private plane had gone down a few short days before uh, in that part of Washington state, and that that was, in fact, why reporters were at that airport. That will need a little bit of extra research, but good point. Yeah, very good point. Well, not to change the subject, but what do any of you think about uh, what's happening on the news today about these uh, Navy uh, gunship sightings and, and recordings and stuff that's been on the news? You mean the Nimitz uh, sightings, the Tic Tac sightings? Yes, the Tic Tac sightings. Yeah, we will definitely get into that here. And uh, whoa, car. Good God, it's Arnold. I know, someone in a truck there. <laughs> a trucker drove by. Oh, my You must goodness. be real close to the highway, Michael. Uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. A ghost truck. I, I don't know where that came from. Not uh, here. <laughs> not, not from me. You should, you should be in a sound studio. Wow, that was wild. But I did like that. It was a good fact. And uh, before we yeah, before we jump right into the current sightings and all of that, I, I just want to ask all three of you this question. Uh, were actual bodies recovered from the crash site? And I've heard in the past that seven bodies total were actually recovered. Uh, you three gentlemen, go ahead. Whoever wants to step up uh, first, uh, go ahead. Stage is yours. Well, since I... Spent the most time investigating the Roswell case. Right. I suppose it. I suppose it's up to me. Go ahead. The best information I have is that there were only four. Um, a fellow named Chester Lytle, who had done a lot of classified work for the government, 
in the 1940s, 1950s, and, and beyond. Uh, I believe was involved in creating the atomic trigger for the atomic bombs used uh, during the World War II. Mm. He was a good friend of Butch Blanchard, Blanchard being the commanding officer of the 509th Bomb Group, the 509th Bomb Group, of course, being the, the guys in Roswell who had discovered the crash in, the, in that. According to Lytle, he was on a, um, he was in Alaska, I think it was, and Blanchard was in Alaska, and, and Lytle's wife was in Chicago and about to give birth. So Blanchard arranged for him to fly on a military aircraft from, from Alaska to, um, to Illinois. And on the flight, they were talking about all sorts of things, and Blanchard finally said something to Lytle about there being four bodies and mentioned this, you know, kind of, mm. um, I guess, it, it, it sort of sort of mentioned it in, in the course of the conversations. Uh, because he, he could trust Lytle not to, to blab to anybody, and Lytle had high clearances as, there, as, as mm. well. Talking to other people who were involved, um, you know, it, it doesn't seem that there were seven. It seems that the number was always four. Now, the next question that become, becomes is, did any survive the crash? And there is some information about that. But we start getting into the areas where there's really not solid information. We're talking about testimony gathered Correct. 40 years after the fact, and yeah. much of it is secondhand. Yeah. Uh, the best example of that is Frankie Rowe. Her father was a firefighter in Roswell in 1947, and she said yeah. her father came home and talked to them about what he had seen. Uh, no question that, that, that uh, her father, Dan Dwyer, was a firefighter. He was a lieutenant in the fire department. No question about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I had looked for – the idea had been the Roswell Fire Department had gone out to the crash site uh, for, for whatever reason. And I had looked through the fire records, and the, they had the records going back into the 1920s, so I was able to go through the records. I could find no official – to run out to the crash site on the dates that we needed to, to, to be there. But they did make runs outside the city limits, contrary to what some people had said. Mm. Uh, Carl Flock, when he was doing his book, Roswell Inconvenient Facts, <laughs> uh, said he talked to one of the firefighters, and he said, no, the fire department didn't go out there. Well, I called the guy and talked to him as well, and I got the same information. The fire department didn't go. And I guess I asked a question, one more question than, <laughs> than Flock had. I said, well, did you know Dan Dwyer? He says, oh, yeah, I knew Dan. He went out there. I'm huh. going to And he said, yeah, this colonel came up, came around from the base. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's always a colonel, never a captain, never a lieutenant, never a sergeant, always a colonel. They didn't have that many colonels in Roswell, by the way. But somebody came out from the, from the base and told him, don't worry about it. We've got it handled. Uh, you don't need to go out there. But Dan Dwyer went out in his private car. So, of course, there's no record of it. But now we've got some corroboration from the rank Frankie Rowe story. And, and uh, Frankie Rowe talked about her father having seen... Um, having seen the bodies. We've got the same thing from the Sheriff Wilcox family. Barbara Duggar told us about that. Inez Wilcox, who was, a, um, who, was a, who was the wife of Sheriff Wilcox, did an article. I think she had an idea of selling it to like Reader's Digest. It was called uh, Four Years in the County Jail. And back in those days, in the 1940s, when you elected a sheriff, his wife normally became the mat uh, matron of the uh, the. The, the, the jail, jail in case they had female prisoners. And so she did the story about four years in the county jail. The problem is there's no date on the article, so we don't know when she wrote it. And the second problem is it's an, there's an addition to it. She had the article written, but she added, added a, a big, long paragraph about how um, the sheriff had been involved with seeing the bodies and that sort of thing, about the little men. Barbara Duggar told us about that, Barbara Duggar being a granddaughter of the, of the sheriff. But you see, we're getting way far away from uh, the, the eyewitness testimony. We're now talking to the, the granddaughter of the sheriff who, who didn't see anything. The sheriff talked to his wife, who talked to the granddaughter. So we're getting like third and fourth hand stories there. So the best information that I've been able to come up with, if there were bodies, there were four. And uh, they were not located on the Brazel Ranch, the Foster Ranch. They were located actually closer to Roswell. As the craft seemed to have come apart. Uh, I, as I said, I did a book uh, a couple of years ago called Roswell in the 21st Century. And what yes. I did was I looked at the whole thing as a cold case. Let's look at it as dispassionately as possible. And let's talk about the story of the bodies and that sort of thing. Jesse Marcel, who was the air intelligence officer. Right. Yes. Never mentioned bodies. To his son, he, 
There are stories now, since uh, he has died, Jesse Marcel Sr. had died, yeah. that he told other members of the family, I'm thinking, no, if he'd have told anybody, he would have told his son. And I Correct. had many conversations I... with his son, and um, he never mentioned the bodies. I mean, before Jesse Marcel went to Iraq, he uh, called me and wanted to know if he should buy a computer to take with him, a laptop. And I said, the best investment I made before I went was a personal laptop. Um, so, you know, I mean, we had that kind of a relationship. So had his father said anything to him, he would have, he would have said something to me. The other thing that Jesse Marcel Jr. said, he wanted to know what the atomic bomb looked like. And back in 1947, the size, the shape, the, the, the look of the atomic bomb was classified information. You did not share that. And yet, Jesse Sr. drew a picture of what uh, essentially is Fat Man. It's an MK3 atomic bomb. Showed it to his son and then shredded the picture and burned the, burned the shreds. Mm. So his father did share classified information with his son. And so, um, you know, had there been bodies, I would expect Jesse Jr. to know it. But Interesting. he never said a word about it. Yes, and, so that's that's mm -hmm. what I know about the bodies, I guess, in not much of a nutshell. I'll come back to you right now. Uh, Mike, how do you feel about that? Well, uh, I don't know much about it. <laughs> uh, I'm Kevin curious. Knows, knows more. Of course, Peter knows a lot. But uh, about that stuff, I really, you know, I was born in 1947. So, sure. Uh, yeah, I couldn't possibly have any real knowledge of it. I'm just wondering <laughs> if you are open-minded towards the idea that bodies were recovered or if you think that is BS. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm open to it. Uh, it's like so many other things. Uh, to be truly unbiased you, you you just can't have an opinion of certain things if you really just don't have enough knowledge to know yes very true and of course i've heard all sorts of theories of what could have possibly crashed i heard things such as uh, japanese men were actually there a part of the crash and that's what that's who was actually recovered in the craft here and of course we all heard the whole story about weather balloons yeah there's a lot of things and that's that's the big thing with me is that and looking at it all, there seems to be so many stories and so much hearsay. Right. Hearsay upon hearsay. It's just, uh, it becomes a blur for one thing. And uh, I feel sorry for these other guys. They've done so <laughs> much research and everything. Uh, I don't know how much good it did. It, it kind of, you know, ends up defining the whole thing. But, I mean, how can you really reach a conclusion? I can't reach a conclusion. Yeah, it's I've pretty difficult. It all, but I can't reach a conclusion. Well, the one thing you have to understand is everybody agrees something fell at Roswell. Mm -hmm. That point is not under in dispute. Everybody True. agrees with that. that what's, in dispute, agree with. what's in dispute is what it was what was it? We have found, and I say we, and I'm thinking of myself and Don Schmidt and Tom Carey and Stan Friedman yep. and uh, uh, the United States Air Force, except they came up with a cockamamie answer, <laughs> uh, really haven't found anything. The Air Force eliminated everything except Project Mogul, <laughs> which was, in essence, weather balloons. <clears throat> Excuse me for a minute. Yeah, go ahead. Cough it up. Oh, my goodness. Uh, they eliminated everything but Project Mogul, and they made this big deal about Project Mogul was so highly classified that the men in New Mexico who were launching the balloons for Mogul didn't even know the name of the project. Well, if you go through the um, diaries of Albert Crary, who was leading project the project, in uh, New Mexico, you find the name Mogul three or four times. So obviously they knew it. Yeah. The, what was going on in New Mexico was not classified. Pictures of Project Mogul balloons were in the newspapers on July 10th, 1947, mm -hmm. all around the country. What was classified was the purpose, which was to put some kind of a constant level balloon in this acoustical layer they postulated was in the atmosphere that could help them detect the Soviet attempts to uh, detonate an atomic bomb. The point simply is the Air Force eliminated everything as a possible explanation from missiles from White Sands, uh, jet aircraft, uh, not jet, well, could have been jet aircraft, uh, experimental aircraft crashing, um, an aircraft with a mock-up of a, an atomic bomb on it. They eliminated everything, and they said, they said well, we, we've decided it was Project Mogul. The flight that they pinpointed, flight number four, launched on June 4th, 1947, for those of you keeping score at home, <laughs> was canceled. The diary says no flight today because of clouds. The arrays were so long that the CAA, which is the forerunner of the FAA, were afraid it would become a hazard to aerial navigation. So they could mm. not launch them at night and they could not launch them into cloud cover. 
And June 4th, there were clouds. They could not, they did not launch it. They flew a cluster of balloons uh, hours later, but a cluster of balloons is not a Project Mogul array. And so there is no terrestrial explanation that I know of right now that fits all the facts. Is that enough to take you to the extraterrestrial? I'm not satisfied with that, but others may, may well be. Um, the stories of the bodies, for the most part, are secondhand. We have a couple of firsthand witnesses that I'm a little bit shaky on about whether they saw the bodies. Recovering of the debris, not a problem. The unusual nature of the debris, um, Bill Brazel sat right across the table from me and to describe what he had seen and what he had, what he had picked up and how it was confiscated by the military. Mm. So there are interesting aspects to the case, but to my way of thinking, it, it does not get me to the point where I can say, yes, this was extraterrestrial. Had we been having this conversation 15 years ago, I'd have said, absolutely, it was extraterrestrial. Sure. Mm. But by reinvestigating it, looking at everything that I've seen and the, the large number of people I've talked to and seeing so many witnesses blow up on us, uh, uh, Glenn Dennis, the War Oswell Mortician, yeah. uh, wasn't telling the truth. Um, Frank Kaufman who claimed to have seen the bodies, wasn't telling the truth. You know, there were any number of people like that that blew up on us, but there's always that core of people. Edwin Easley, the provost marshal, the top cop on the air base at the time, talked to him. I think I'm the only person that ever talked to him. And at one point in our conversations, and I usually recorded them, I, but for those of you who don't, don't, don't know, back in the 1990s, you used to have to pay for long distance phone calls. <laughs> and you could run up really, really high phone bills really, really quickly by doing this sort of thing. Oh, Today's yeah. world, you know, I don't care. It's free on, well, we're doing all kinds of long distance here for free, basically. Oh, yeah. um, so I was at the Center for UFO Studies. They were having a board meeting, and Don and I were there to um, kind of update where the Roswell investigation was. And they said, hey, you know, if you want to make some phone calls, there's the phone. And I'm thinking, yeah, I got a phone to use. So <laughs> one of the people I called was Edwin Easley. And the point of this was, so I'm talking to Edwin Easley, and I said to him, are we following the right path? And Easley says to me, what do you mean? And I said, we think it's extraterrestrial. And he said, well, let me tell you, let me put it this way, it's not the wrong path. So he's in essence telling me it's the right path. So here's the guy, um, top cop on the base, part of Blanchard's primary staff, telling me that it's basically extraterrestrial. Before he died, one of the daughters, he was, he was, terminally ill with cancer, and he was in the hospital. One of his daughters asked him about the Roswell case, and he said to them, oh, the creatures. Mm. Is that impressive piece of evidence? I don't know. I, I find my conversation with easily suggesting, you know, that, that they were moving toward the extraterrestrial. The comment about the creatures uh, is secondhand. He didn't make it to me, but he did talk to me about these sorts of things uh, repeatedly. The only time that I ever saw Sheridan Cavett get uh, worried, and Cavett was the counterintelligence guy who went out to the debris field with, with Marcel. The only time I ever saw him get worried in a conversation with us, we were talking about the bodies. And uh, we're sitting in his living room, and he leans forward, and he picks up a magazine, he leans back, he throws it down, he says, Bill Rickett tell you that? Bill Rickett was his, uh, his NCO. And I'm trying to protect Rickett, said, no, we got it from Edwin Easley, and he visibly relaxed. And I thought, well, I just blew the conversation there. <laughs> uh, but the point is, you know, there's some interesting, I guess, evidence, testimony, that leads us in that direction toward bodies, toward uh, an alien spacecraft. But the, the hurdle to get over for, for the absolute proof, yes, this was extraterrestrial, we just don't have it yet. I, I, you know, I can point to any other number of witnesses who handled the strange debris and gave us descriptions of this. Before all of this got over all over the, the internet, which didn't really exist that much in 19, 1990 when we started this, and there wasn't a whole lot of discussion about what the debris looked like and all of this sort of thing. So we were getting to people. We were going out and finding the people. But they weren't coming to us and say, yeah, I saw this and I saw that. We were going out and finding the people, and we were getting the same kind of descriptions from them from multiple sources that were independent of one another. But, um, you know, it, it, for me, I just need a little bit more to push me over that edge to the extraterrestrial. You know, one of the biggest things I have against uh, Roswell, the crash, is that it's hard for me to believe that an alien race, extraterrestrials, came all this way, however they got here, and then they just crashed. 
That just that just doesn't really sound logical to it's me. It's a little weird. May I well, jump maybe, in? Go maybe ahead. Maybe the guy pushed the wrong button. Um, I don't think so. Ever, <laughs> wherever we, we have, uh, we in the research community, and um, I guess you could say in the popular imagination, um, the the mantra that propelled the X Files through ten sensationally successful years. Those words on that simple poster, I want to believe. Uh, speaking for myself as an investigative writer who does his best to try to be as objective as possible, we all have our predispositions. I would like that story to be true. There's so much information, and Kevin is one of, not just one of the great sources, because he is such an ethical and committed researcher. He just gave us kind of a microcosm example. And I, I want to say, Kevin, um, the, the book that you mentioned, is it Roswell in the 20th century? What was the exact 21st title? Century. 21st Roswell century. 21st century. What, what the evidence is today, where we are today with the case. Thank you. Um, I've read a lot of books on Roswell. Um, that, for me, is in a place by itself because you maintain a level of ob objectivity that I usually associate with extremely um, um, revered people in like law enforcement. It, this again is a completely unregulated field. And let's face it, we have colleagues, they may be very nice people, but they have agendas and they will put forward something that is mm, theoretical, um, but that they lean toward. And rather than saying my theory is, or I believe that, they will simply state it with the understanding that it's empirical fact, which is a very poor way to proceed. Um, like many people in the field, I'm not a Roswell specialist, but from the time I became involved in the subject, I remember in 1980 um, when Berlitz's book um, with, um, oh God. Uh, Bill Moore. Exactly, Bill Moore came out and the game was afoot. Um, I was lucky enough to count Dear Stanton Friedman, as a, a friend, a mentor, and a colleague for many years, um, I admired his research tremendously. That moment that you described of what the, is the equivalent of a dying declaration, those two words, the creatures, for me, that carries a certain kind of gravitas. Again, of course, it's anecdotal information, but it stays in a special place for me. The same thing for the fine work over the years of of um, um, Don Schmidt um, and yeah, Don's um, been at it for a long time. Yeah, I'm, yeah, exactly. Uh, no question about it. Um, Don and his um, brilliant Don writing, exactly writing partner. Um, when they published Witness to Roswell, um, I read it very carefully. In fact, I read some of it in galleys and. Mm, I had worked for several years, a point of great pride with me. Um, Kevin, you remember Sam Legrone, who was uh, mayor of Roswell a dozen years yes, ago? Yes, so, yes, A yes, good man yes. who really believed in um, trying to associate the city with the seriousness of this subject. And um, I was hired by him and worked out of the mayor's office, of course, in New York State here, for two years as their liaison um, with with Governor Richardson on any matters related to UFOs or the festival or the conference. And I was very proud of helping for several years organize the conference. Um, I insisted at one point that um, Nick Redfern come in and be a speaker and give his alternate theory on Roswell. It wasn't a, uh, a popular talk among the true believers, but I thought <laughs> it was very important to present the alternate view. Um, I've read a lot of the literature. I've spent time on the ground in Roswell. Um, Kevin's books have been an in inspiration to me. Again, Don and Tom's, um, so much good research has been done. Of course, the fact is, there is no absolutely empirical, convincing court-level evidence of bodies. No smoking gun. I, I tend to believe yeah. that there were, based I on see. everything that I was told. Also, in witness to Roswell, quieting these witnesses, and many of them very poignant who I met, most of them are gone now, as Kevin knows, the ones that are left are in their late 80s and 90s, of young people who were approached by specially trained MPs, rather intimidating for their height, 
and their directness with these young people, essentially threatening their lives and their parents' lives if they ever spoke about it. One, again, it's anecdotal, but what was behind that tremendous effort to quiet these people down? True. In art school, at one point, we studied what we call negative drawing. Don't draw the figure, but draw the space around it i.e. you will end up with a simple silhouette drawing if you draw that triangular space where their hand is you know kind of uh, against their hip that kind of thing we have if we do the drawing on roswell with all of the information that's been available to us over the decades for me convincing evidence that there were bodies but if anybody tells you yes it's true and it's absolutely a fact i'm from missouri allegorically show me uh, by the way, Peter, did you just say that you wanted to believe? That I, did I say what? Did you want to believe? Oh, I, I absolutely will admit that. Um, I do want to believe that after everything about the information that's come out, that there were no bodies, that these craft piloted themselves, and to um, um, uh, the very important question put forward by Mike, you know, they come all this way and they crash. Well, <laughs> yes, you don't have to be, you know, from another planet to know that the more complex the piece of machinery, the more chances there are for a small part to fail. Technology uh, will Friedman fail. Theorized that it was uh, the effects of a lightning storm. Um, it could happen. No it's question possible. about it. And they're not um, infallible. <laughs> well, technology well, failed me earlier, so I know it's Nick, it's possible. There's another possibility there. That's right. You know, take it. Take 747 airliners, for instance. They have such a tremendous track record, and they're an extremely complicated piece of equipment, and yeah. you hardly ever see one uh, fall out of the sky. It just doesn't, doesn't seem to happen very often, very few times, actually. And like uh, Bonus Airlines, no crashes in all this time. You know, when I flew to Australia here a few years back on Qantas, I was I felt perfectly fine. I had no sure. fear at all because of that right track record. And, you know, I think an alien race would have much more technology, much better fine-tuned. Their ability to get across space without any mishap and come to Earth and then because of a simple thing, just crash, it just it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's a little no, weird. My, Mike, you, you actually said it hardly ever. It's right. not infallible all you need to do is have it happen once as as our dear friend stan friedman used to say the question is not are ufos representative of advanced technology under intelligent control coming and going from parts unknown the question is has one ever been and the answer to that i think is a resounding yes all you need to do is have it happen once that's true and yeah but I how many times has it supposedly happened how many times well, uh, well if you want, if I don't you know that know, number. If and you want to know the not... actual number, you want to know the actual number? Sure. One. One. All the other all the other stories you hear about UFO crashes are nonsense. Okay. Well, I believe there are and I've, and I've looked at I've looked at literally I, I did a book called Crash When UFOs <laughs> Fall from the Sky and I get I get hammered for that because it was like I was trying to 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 um um how dare you explain all all the ufo crashes and all i'm doing is presenting the best information available about these various crashes uh, in Kevin. that book um i actually i think there's five that i i suggest are possible since that i wrote that book i've decided that you know four of them probably are something else <laughs> but to answer mike's question i i have a theory that i love and people thought i was suggesting it for real which is uh they did it on purpose what is the most non-threatening way to announce yourself interesting to a uh, another sentient race who might be paranoid and god knows we're paranoid mm. and you mean they actually crashed just well to, just to no that? i think they I, I think they rigged it so it looked like there was a crash and they were there were uh, bodies wow. and, and all that so that they wouldn't be as frightening as if they'd come <laughs> down from on high like the angels would do or something <laughs> like that very interesting interesting theory very interesting but, but please hey. know for anybody keeping score at home, I really don't subscribe to the theory. I just think it's neat. I yeah, hear well, you. I take to uh, off. Well done. You know, what is the most likely here? What is the most likely? Well, I'm not sure how to answer that. Most likely <laughs> what? Reason what they crash? The, yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you take everything into consideration, making everything equal, or, you know, 
which is the most likely of of all the theories and, and or the of the two theories or whatever. But which is most likely, in my opinion, of course it's, it is an opinion. Uh, what's most likely is there was no crash, and what you said just now about it being something they staged, that holds more credibility for me than anything else. Mike, a question for you. Um, how would you describe the research, the readings that you've done on Roswell over the years? That I've done? I haven't done any research on Roswell except reading. Well, I mean, I've, I've read a lot of stuff, but I haven't done any writing on it. Okay. Because um, you said something before that is something that I live by. Um, I'd rather, and I, I, I make a point in, in cases where I don't have information or I don't have what I consider enough information to have an informed opinion. And if I can't have an informed opinion, I, I will simply say I don't have an opinion on that yet. But you know, you're right. It's an interesting case. I should read into it. Um, learn more about it, and then um, call in on another show when I'm on in the future, and then ask me, and, and if I have enough information, yes, I will give you my opinion. It sounds to me, with respect and affection as a friend, that you're saying you discount it, but you don't really have enough information on it to discount it. Well, I don't have enough information, but I do have information about the whole thing in general. And, and uh, what Kevin has brought forth here and you concerning it is, is the most information I've actually heard close hand here. Uh, and I'm based on that, uh, that's the reason I brought this up. You know, Occam's razor. If, if I look at everything you guys have said about it over the last 30 minutes or so, I have to say, you know, what is the most likely? Because that's just purely logic, pure logic. I agree. Occam's razor is, is certainly a philosophical model that I follow. But when you're discounting, um, let's categorize it for what it is, a legendary story, the kind of holy grail of UFO stories, um, the account of somebody that um, Don and I both were fortunate to consider a friend, Jesse Marcel Jr., um, who made it clear on numerous accounts to us personally and in public forums and in documentaries about being woken up, his father in the kitchen with this box of material that allegedly came from the crash site. Do you think that he lied to his son or his son lied to us or that this material was just a bunch of explainable parts from an old tractor thrown out in the field to, um, you know, screw around with people? Um, we're, we're talking about the reputations and the sworn accounts of people I think are honorable and never caught um, fabricating anything. Um, Jesse, if anything, was a model citizen, followed his dad into the service, became a, a flight surgeon, finished his, his service in the United States military as a field surgeon on the ground um, at the age of 70 or 71. I mean... This was a no-nonsense guy who didn't spin things. At least that's my my very real impression of him from the time that I got to know him. And if you discount the whole story, what are you saying? That all well, of these people I'm that not discounting the whole story. I'm just I'm just looking at this from the outside, uh, <laughs> strictly from scientific logic. You know, just straight out logic. Uh, and and you call the philosophical thing Occam's razor is not really philosophical. It's a scientific uh, principle. It's uh, right. You know, it's uh, it's like I say, it's just from the outside. I'm not trying to discount anybody's story. I will add one thing to that. Everybody is capable of exaggeration. Everybody. Sure. And everybody seems to do it at least a little bit. And you never can pin down exactly who exaggerated or why or, or on what basis they exaggerated. But exaggeration is a big part of uh, human emotion, you know. Uh, people just can't seem to keep from it. And uh, so there it is. It's a very interesting case, though. Everyone always wonders uh, all the time if it was a weather balloon, uh, some sort of spy device. Uh, what what could it have been? Uh, one of ours. Well, I, I think a weather balloon can and should be discounted, uh, but that is my opinion. Well, I would say that a weather balloon is discounted because Mac Brazel, the guy who took the yeah. debris to uh, Roswell, 
uh, was interviewed in the newspaper, the article that many of the skeptics point to, and I think it's the second to last paragraph, says that he had found weather balloons on his ranch and two other occasions, and this was nothing like it. That's yeah. true, because so the materials had are... Had it been Project Mogul or a weather balloon, it would have been exactly like that. The weird thing yep. is that those materials, like like you just said, uh, very different from any weather balloon. <laughs> to put and it we mildly. Can, we can look at, I mean, if oh, we yeah. want to get into the minutia, um, there's any number of people that Bill Brazel showed those pieces of the debris he found. He, he described for me three pieces of the debris he found. One he described like montofilament fishing line. He says you could shine an end, uh, light in one end, and out, it came out the other, meaning, of course, he's talking about fiber optics, fiber optics back in 1947. Yeah. He's talking about a piece of debris uh, about five inches long, and kind of jagged on the edges. And he said he was trying to get a shaving off it with his pocket knife that he used to cut barbed wire to see if it was any stratification there. And he said it was light like balsa wood. And the final piece was the the famous one where he said it was a, like a piece of uh, tin foil, yeah. lead foil, that you wad it up in a ball and you drop it and it would unfold itself, go back to its original shape. Yeah. And and, and But it, the descriptions are not just from Bill Brazel. Correct. Uh, he showed it to a number of people and we have their testimony as well. The Air Force, when they did their uh, big investigation, they actually edited some of the affidavits that people had sworn to about what they had seen and, and that sort of thing. And the one that, that, that strikes my mind was Sally, Sally Tadalini. And she was describing about the stuff and she said it, the, the, the foil was kind of stiff like um, um, a leather, she said. And she'd been ironing clothes all day. So she was she was fascinated by this this debris that would unfold itself with no wrinkles. Yes. And the Air Force cut out part of what she had said to make it sound like she was mm. describing something that was very trustfully yeah. um, manufactured. Terrible. So, I mean, when you get into the depth, the minutia, you know, Occam's razor is a wonderful thing, but Occam's razor has to explain all the facts. <laughs> and Occam's razor does not explain the facts when you look at all of the testimony given by people. And yeah, I understand people exaggerate. And that was why Don and I and Tom and and, and Stan and uh, Don Berliner talked to so many people over such a long period of time yeah. and compared those testimonies with one another, gathered the affidavits. And I can tell you who was fabricating and who was confabulating and who's uh, stories might have been influenced by things they'd seen in the documentaries or read in magazines. I can look at all of that stuff because I'm familiar enough with the story and I can see where the trends are and I can see where the people uh, didn't have an opportunity to uh, see these things. Robert Smith, one of the air crew members, uh, talked to us about having seen a piece of the metallic debris. Um, so we, we just had any number of people talking about this thing. It's just not one or two people. We, we've talked to literally dozens of people about it. And there is no terrestrial explanation that I know of, which is not to say that somebody might not show up tomorrow and say, hey, here's what it was. Mm. But there is no terrestrial explanation I know of at this point that explains all the aspects of the Roswell case. And for Occam's razor to work, you need it to explain them all. Yes. Well, I got to tell you something. I've just been uh, playing the devil's advocate here. <laughs> you know, I I am not a skeptic. Uh, I, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not even close to being a skeptic. Although I've been called that a lot lately because of the Phoenix Lights, uh, and that's a whole different subject. But uh, you know, I'm just playing the devil's advocate here because it seemed like somebody needed to do that. Amazing. And of course, I do want to ask you, Kevin, why would the military even put out a press conference about this or a press release, you know, rather? That's a hell of a question. I do not know. Uh, I've I'm still wondering. To, I'm still wondering right number, now why they would. I've talked to any number of people about that. Now, one of my additional duties when we were in Iraq was was the public affairs officer. Um, and I can't understand why I was appointed a public affairs officer to write magazine articles or newspaper articles for the for the uh, battalion <laughs> in Iraq. Yes, because I had absolutely no experience in that realm. But um, and I was and I you know I was a little bit um, freer was allowed to to run around a little freer than Walter Hot. He he wrote the press release or put out the press release. Right. Um, Colonel Blanchard is the one that ordered it. Colonel Blanchard, the base commander, under his authority, he was the one that said, yeah, put out the press release. Yeah. I don't understand that at all. It makes no logical sense. Uh, Frank Kaufman attempted to explain it, but Frank Kaufman, of course, is 
not a credible witness, but what he said was he, it, and it's kind of an interesting theory, was the idea was, we'll tell him we have a flying saucer, and then a couple of hours later, we'll reveal what it really is, yeah. and people will stop talking Jesus. about it. And uh, that actually worked. Yeah. I mean, they, they said, we have a flying saucer, and then three hours later, Ramey, General Ramey in Fort Worth said, ah, it's a weather balloon, and everybody said, okay, catch you later, guys. Yeah. Uh, what they didn't understand was at that point where Ramey says it's a weather balloon, the reporters couldn't find anybody else to talk to. Where was Jesse Marcel? Well, when they called his house or they called out to the base, well, he's not here. He's in Fort Worth. Well, where's Where's Mac Brazel? Well, he lives out near Corona um, without a telephone. And, and, and when we first went out there in 1989, it was really still difficult to find. And it, all these back roads you had to follow, and it was a hell of a trip from Roswell to Corona because of the roads. Right, right. It's not a big long distance. It was just the roads were all crappy. Mm. Uh, but you know that was that was the idea. Tell them tell them we have it, and then have a higher headquarters say no, it's something else. And and if that was their plan, it worked brilliantly until Jesse Marcel Sr. started telling his ham radio buddies that he'd picked up pieces of flying saucer. Yeah. So um, I don't know why they would put out put out the press release. The, the idea that Walter Hot had was that uh, Blanchard. Um, knew that there was a lot of worry about what these flying saucers were because of everything that circulated in the newspaper and in the media at that time. And he had an answer, and he was trying to alleviate some of that concern about what it could possibly be. Right. He says, don't worry about it. We got a flying saucer type thing. So um, that makes a little bit of sense. But but in reality, you know, uh, the thing is, uh, we don't in intelligence work. You don't tell anybody anything that you know. Um, to, to answer a question, I, the best example I can think of is I was I was stationed down at Richards Gebauer in Kansas City, and yes, we called it Dickie Goober for no good reason, <laughs> as an intelligence officer, and I got a call from a reporter, and he was asking me questions about this event had taken place, and this was like 1976 or something, this event had taken place. I knew fully about it because I'd read all the classified message traffic on it. And he was calling me and asking me about it. And I kept saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't, I, I, I can't help you. And he was looking for a source. He could say a source at Richard Gebauer, confirm, blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't going to become that source. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I was smart enough to dodge. You know, and he's calling me names. Well, you're just really a lousy intelligence officer. And I said, well, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, he ain't giving you any information there, I pal. But um I, I don't understand the press release. I really don't understand it. I don't understand why they would put out the press release because the best move from an intelligence standpoint is not to say anything about it and deny everything. Yes. You know, that's, that's what you do. You just deny everything, even though it's it, it's true because, you know, the material is classified. Um, yeah, that's one thing that's always confused me, just the simple fact that they did that and why the military would suddenly just changed the story from flying saucer to weather balloon. It, it makes no sense. Well, yeah, but, right. there was um, the other uh, thing that's interesting. The other thing is interesting. There's no mention of, of the Roswell case in the Project Blue Book files with the exception of a paragraph in a news story that appears in an, another case file. And it just says that the guys at Roswell had been issued a blistering rebuke for the uh, press release of a couple days earlier. <laughs> and once I found that article in Blue Book, I called Walter Hot. And I said, Walter, you ever get a call from Washington uh, dressing you down for making this mistake? And he says, nah, we never got anything like that. I remember if I got a call from Washington yelling at me. Um, <laughs> so, you know, they, they put out all these stories, but it did kill it did kill the rumors of Roswell for uh, quite a long time. Yes. Now, go ahead, Robin. Um Robbins, yeah, uh, Mr. Robbins, Peter. go ahead. I like to call uh, you. I like to call everyone by their last name. It seems more proper. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, well, you one can thing, refer to me as His Royal Highness. Then I could do that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, the one thing that always stuck in my mind uh, about the release of the information is that it came from, as I understand it, directly from the base commander, General Butch Blanchard, a tough son of a gun, World War II veteran. Um, a, a distinguished military person who did something that now would be beyond unthinkable. He simply authorized the release of this information without clearing it with the Pentagon. He did it. It was done. We can only imagine uh, the number of, of brains that exploded in Washington and the rebukes, of what they were, some people would have loved to have done uh, above him, but he made that decision. He authorized it. 
The press release was put out and history revolved around that. Also, if I might, just I, I love language. Um, as a writer, I'm fascinated by the derivation of words and sometimes the, mit, mm, the latitude we give them. Um, there are those of us, by dint of experience, like Mike, uh, by sheer study, um, research, involvement. I, I think of how many several hundred uh, abduction cases I was privileged to be at the side of Bud Hopkins as he investigated. Um, my point being is for some of us, we hit a point where we no longer have the luxury of disbelief. And for those of us in that spot, it becomes doubly incumbent to, and I use this word with affection and respect, to be skeptical. Because if we're not, because we quote unquote know or feel we know that the phenomena is real, to simply assume, well, you know, my tremendous experience, my experience uh, directly has told me that this is real. So I'm going to look into this case as if it were real, as opposed to deductive reasoning to start with the most mundane possibilities, work your way up to the second most mundane possibilities. I think what we mean to say is we're not debunkers. Bud used to joke, and he had a wicked sense of humor, aren't these people amazing? Often with the, the king of the debunkers at the time, the late not-so-great Philip Class, they actually know that UFO abductions and the UFO phenomena are not real. We're struggling in the dark trying to figure out what the heck is going on, like the seven blind men and the elephant, describing different phenomena to each other. But they, in their empirical wisdom, they know that it's not real. We are not debunkers. We should be responsible skeptics, employing that skepticism in the service of the truths that we understand um, and to assist us in reaching our next conclusions in the most grounded way possible. Well, as you all know, I have a whole different take on debunkers. I call them uh, the main debunkers, pseudo debunkers. Uh, <laughs> Ankle you know, biters. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Um, just, um, I call them ankle biters. They just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good name, but I think pseudo debunker would be best because pseudo means they're not a debunker. Uh, <laughs> And in, well, you know, I've had a little bit of the experience with that, but my experience has been direct. Philip did you Clark. ever? Yes, and 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 I I'm very experienced with Philip Class. I was his number one uh, bad oh, rat boy, you know. Yeah. Uh, and him and I had so much. I mean, we filled a couple of volumes full of conversation, written and otherwise, uh, many hours and hours of telephone conversations, right up until within a couple of hours, years before he died, and. Uh, <laughs> It's very strange with Phil Class, and, and I don't know, uh, I haven't dealt directly with Tony Ortega in the same way. Yeah. But Tony Ortega's take on the Phoenix Lights is so strange. It can't be anything but a Philip Class take, you know. Uh, now, Philip Class, you know, pseudo debunkers can be real debunkers uh, on certain things. Uh, in fact, that's what gives them credibility. Uh, but when it came to the Walden case, Every single thing he came up with could be easily explained logically, uh, factually, you know, most of the time. And uh, when it came right down to it, uh, in my opinion, and more strongly now than ever before, uh, he was not trying to put this case down. He was trying to build it up. Mm -hmm. And that sounds extremely strange, but I have all kinds of proof of that and all kinds of evidence for it. Uh, in fact, that's all I do have is evidence for it. I don't have anything to the contrary. Understood. And we'll jump right into that in a moment here, but I did have one more question for uh, our friend, Mr. Kevin Randall here, our Lord and Savior, Kevin Randall. <laughs> and um, that was about uh, Philip J. Corso. I did want your take on uh, what he talked about for a long time himself. I can sum it up in one word, crapola. <laughs> I had a feeling you'd say that. Well, I, for, from the cover of his book, he said it, he said he was Colonel Philip J. Corso. He was never promoted to colonel. He was a lieutenant colonel. Now you can address him as colonel. I, I know I retired right. as a lieutenant colonel myself, so yes. I understand all of this sort of thing. But um, the other thing is, if, if you move through the military hierarchy, you know the, the the promotion from second lieutenant to first lieutenant to captain are pretty much routine. Everybody makes it. 
unless they quit or they do something really, really stupid. The jump from captain to major is a little bit bigger step um, because you're moving into the field grade and then the next step up to lieutenant colonel isn't that great. When you go to colonel, that's a much bigger step and then into, into general. So if you're a colonel, you know, it's much more prestigious than being just a, a, a lieutenant colonel. But the problem is when, when Corso was confronted with this, why does it say colonel on the front of your book? Instead of saying the publisher made a mistake and didn't understand, sure. He said, well, I was promoted to colonel when I retired. No hmm. evidence of that whatsoever. I had a similar situation. I did a book called UFO Casebook back in 1989. Oh, my God, it was so long ago. And on it, on it said, it said, Captain, U.S. Air Force retired. And some guy wrote a nasty article about me saying, you couldn't possibly be retired. You're too young. And I said, well, since I joined the military, <laughs> I said, when I, when I joined the military when I was 18, I <laughs> technically could be retired. But the publisher made a mistake. He, I had signed the name USAFR for reserve, and he thought the R meant retired. And so Corso mm. could have deflated that whole argument by saying the, the, the publisher understood. I'm addressed as colonel. He didn't understand the differences here. But, but, it's, but it's much more than that. It's, it's the things that he said. The idea that they were transporting the bodies from Roswell on a convoy of trucks is absolutely ludicrous. And I was in an aviation unit in Vietnam, and we treated the helicopters, the the aviation assets, like most other people treat tr cars and trucks. You know, we wanted to go to Saigon. We flew to Saigon. We didn't take a truck down to Saigon. And they would have done the same thing in Roswell. They would have taken aircraft and flown the stuff to right field rather than moving it over, over land. But let's say they did for whatever reason. The convoy stopped at uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, what would be called a, a run, remain overnight, because you can only drive so far according to regulations, and that would have been about the halfway point. Then he says, well, they apparently unloaded the trucks, took all the stuff into a building, um, and, and put other guards on it. I'm thinking if it's my convoy and I'm carrying classified material, and we actually move stuff by convoy, the weapons across state lines, so we had to be very careful about moving automatic weapons across state lines. Mm. So I know how this stuff works. Um, you don't unload it. You put your own guards on it. You don't have the, the local base putting guards on it. Uh, they may guard your perimeter, but you've got your own guards on the stuff. So the idea that he was able to see a body in a box that was in a vet building at Fort Riley, Kansas, that one of his sergeant friends saw and said, you've got to come and see this, is just preposterous on the face of it. It just would have never happened in any possible realm. Uh, there, there's many, many other things like that in, in Corso's books that just scream that it's not an accurate story, not accurate. an accurate representation. Understood. It's too bad we didn't have Richard Doty here. Oi. <laughs> if I may add one Go thought. Go ahead, yes. Um, when I read the book, I don't have a military background. Uh, I can only do my best to use logic and critical thinking and informed judgment. The idea that Mr. Corso put forward of... The crash happens. They recover, you know, all kinds of parts, things that will lead to fiber optics and other kind of technological breakthroughs. Sure. And they essentially park them in a filing cabinet somewhere in the Pentagon for 10 years. And 10 years later, in 1957, somebody comes upon them and says, you know, um, uh, Phil, uh, look into this stuff, sort it out. I, I thought that was so counterintuitive. It seems to me that if Roswell happened, as some of us think, that a machine of advanced technology, parts unknown, crashes in a remote area, military collects the pieces, has a basic sense that what they have here is extremely important, revolutionary, historic stuff, they're going to create a mini Manhattan project around that, and they're going to start researching it in high security right then and there. They're not going to Put it away for 10 years and forget about it. Um, for me, that's a huge problem that I had my own problem getting beyond and moving into the other minutia uh, of, of Mr. Corso's claims. Understood. And before we move on to other topics here, I did want to bring up uh, TV shows really quickly here. I wanted to give a ton of credit to the History Channel and the, and the TV series Ancient Aliens, who I personally believe 
have given a shot of adrenaline to the UFO community, to be honest with you. And it's brought forth uh, new generations of, I guess, uh, new, um, I, I guess I should say fans, perhaps, or just people that believe in the whole idea of the ancient astronaut theory and uh, so forth up to modern times from the past. And I was just curious what all three of you thought about the TV program as well as the... Uh, well, go ahead and answer that question first before I throw another one. I'll grab that one first. Go ahead. Um, I was a guest most recently on Ancient Aliens last uh, September. Um, actually, a particularly interesting show about the UFO phenomena and Russia going back to the pre-Soviet days, uh, really the old czarist days and certain philosophies that informed um, what became the Soviet commitment to space. Um, I think, number one, choosing the name Ancient Aliens was a double-edged sword for the show, which of course has been phenomenally successful. Yes, They limited themselves, and um, I think Eric von Daniken, a Swiss-German uh, journalist, who created the book that set this all in motion in the mid-60s, was on to something important. If they've been coming here, it hasn't didn't start in 1946 or 1942. It's probably been going on since time immemorial. Yeah. I accept that. And I think there is enough um, interesting, anecdotal, thought-provoking materials caught up in and 14th century Yugoslavian frescoes and certain um, paintings from um, the 17th and 16th century, even going back to certain really ancient uh, things. But I think so much of what's put forward on the show, and I say this with respect, is explainable in much more conventional terms. When I'm shown a cave drawing of a being with large black eyes and lines radiating off, radiating off his head, I don't think alien first. I think, ah, charcoal around the eyes and sticks on an armature for some long forgotten ceremony from 15,000 years ago. Um, at the same time, you're absolutely right, Michael. The show is a huge success internationally. It has sparked phenomenal interest in the subject. But it has also created almost um, a cult of I want to believe. Very true. That everything that looks vaguely strange from ancient cultures is the result of extraterrestrial intervention. Yeah, very true. <laughs> I had to put that on there. It, it, it's only appropriate. But yes, I agree with you 100% on your assessment there. Um, I honestly believe that a lot of the information that they put forth is fabricated for TV purposes. And I know that's gonna, uh, that's gonna piss people off, but I mean, let's just be realistic here. Some of the yeah. things that they do bring forth are, they, they can be explained uh, logically. And I yeah. definitely feel like they fabricate a lot of the material. And of course I have no problem talking about it even though I ate dinner with the producer before. It's not like I'm gonna be on the show. So I don't have a problem <laughs> talking bad about it. Now that lead question of, could it be? Well, I guess, but is it logical or are the chances uh, with us that it is? Not necessarily. Again, this is a perfect example of infotainment. Um, they want to engage the audience. They have commercials that um, are, are making, uh, you know, generating money for the production companies. Oh, yeah. This is great. I have no problem with it. But you're there to entertain people as well as inform them and hopefully accurately inform them when it becomes confabulation exaggeration or you bring on personalities who are stating things as imperial fact empirical fact that in fact are anything but that's where i have a big problem yes that's where it crosses the line and go ahead kevin or mike whichever go ahead well uh, you know i've seen all through my life uh People just want to make themselves important. They want to be more important than they really are, and uh, that seems to spawn an awful lot of exaggeration, a whole lot of this confabulation, as you say. You know, <laughs> these shows like that, you know, from the outside, you cannot tell exactly what is and isn't real or to what degree there's been an exaggeration. Uh, and the only thing you can really do is just 
if you're logical, is say, well, that's what they say, and what, am I, what else am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Kevin. I've looked at a lot of this stuff. The one thing that always bothered me about the ancient astronauts is they come down to Earth in their metallic spaceships, and the only ma building material they can find is stone. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. You know, I think they would have been able to develop some metallurgy to help out. Uh, you know, so when you're saying, well, they helped build the pyramids. Yeah, well, how come they didn't have any metal involved in that? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, there, are, there are a lot of things that are inexplicable to us. When I was studying anthropology in, in college, the one thing that struck me is every time they'd come to an artifact they didn't really understand, they'd say, well, that has religious significance, ah, which means right absolutely you. nothing. <laughs> And, and uh, you know, it's sort of the same thing with the, well, we don't understand this, but so it must be alien. That's been and the narrative with that TV show for, for a long time now, the whole aliens and religion thing. And we see that with politics too. Uh, aliens become the new religion. Politics become the new religion as well. We see this sort of a mindset throughout uh, humanity. It's interesting, right? Yeah, very yeah. interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, mystifying what we don't understand is a fallback position to, uh, I don't know, engage us in discussions of supreme beings and the like, as opposed to um, practical solutions or interpretations that are explainable in more conventional terms, which again, granted, is a lot less sexy, a lot less exotic. It certainly doesn't sell commercial time. But yes, we don't understand it, therefore it must be um, you know, a religious object created by this ancient culture for some ceremony to contact their, uh, you know, um, the beings that they worshipped or what have you. I'm sorry, it's too convenient an excuse. My, my problem with it all is this. Why in the world is it so important that people have to believe in something? Uh, uh, I, I realize that, that it is for a lot of people, but you know, the thing is, all of this exaggeration, all of this hype with uh, TV shows, movies, and everything else, uh, what is really happening there is people are accepting something that isn't really real in place of what is real. And there is so much out there that is actually real, and these people are just missing it. There is so much out there people just don't even know about. And uh, so as the human race goes, they're missing the boat. That's, in the long run, that's what's happening, in my opinion. Understood. Yeah. And before we move on from the topic of TV shows, there was another popular TV uh, series that's going on. That's Project Blue Beam, which I think, Kevin, uh, you've been following a lot more closely than I have. I've tried you mean Project Blue Book. Or Project Blue Book, rather. Yes, I always get those two mixed up when I'm talking about the uh, TV show title. Um, I tried watching it. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things I do like, but then there's some parts where it kind of drags on. Uh, ever so slightly, if you know what I mean. If you wanted an accurate representation of what went into Project Blue Book or went on with Project Blue Book, right. well, that wasn't the program to watch. If you looked at it as science fiction, it was sort of entertaining. And for those of who you, again, who are keeping score at home, home, you know the star of it was Littlefinger. Mm, yes. Um, I'll leave that reference where it is, I guess. Yes. <laughs> but I, I enjoyed the program because I, I could separate it from the reality. And I, I wondered as I watched a couple of the episodes what the Heineck family thought about it. And I, uh, I actually called Paul Heineck and talked to him about it. Actually, I did. I, I, I interviewed him on my radio show to talk to him about, about it as well to see what he, um, what he thought. And they, they loved the, the Heinecks loved the show. Uh. They thought it was great. But, of course, there were no fist fights and there were no people jumping out of windows and there were no airplane flights and all of the the things they brought in that Heineck did, uh, you know, it just wasn't quite that uh, exciting. He was more of a consultant than an actual investigator, especially in the beginning. He was just looking at it from the astronomical point of view. What if it was there an astronomical explanation for this sighting later on? He, be, he, he did more of the field work as well, but they, um, they, they liked it. I liked the program. I, in fact, I talked to a lot of people that were involved with the program and I, I just could separate the, um, the fact from the fiction, but that's because I understood the stories and I knew what the stories were. Yes. In reality. Understood. Yes. Uh, but yeah. one of the interesting things is they, they, um, they interviewed um, Robert friend who was one time the 
chief of Project Blue Book. Robert Friend was yeah. a Tuskegee Airman during World War II. Oh my God, that's right. Yeah, I wish I'd have known that. <gasps> uh, I would have talked to him more about that than UFOs for crying out loud. <laughs> True. And he said, well, he said after the Tuskegee Airmen um, movie came out, he he had a lot of people wanting him to come and talk to their groups. Which I'll bet. Um, but the uh, the interesting, well, he just passed away a couple of a couple of months ago at the age of ninety nine. Mm. But oh, wow. they talked to him about the program. I put on my blog uh, a picture of a friend with a couple, couple of the people that were producing the program as well. So, uh, you know, I enjoyed the program. I liked the program. I understood that some of my colleagues in the UFO field absolutely hated it because of the liberties it took with the stories. Right. But I was able to separate that from uh, the reality of it, and you know, I could recognize what story they were talking about. The the one thing I told I told one of the producers, I said I probably know something that that you guys don't know. And and uh, Neil McDonough, who was the, one of the generals, a, an actor who I've admired for a long time, especially after Band of Brothers, uh, the Air Force general. Yeah. And, I, and I said, you know, you're you're dealing in 1952, and he's running around in the Air Force. I said he's wearing an Air Force Commendation Medal. I said you probably don't know this, but that medal wasn't. Uh, created until 1958, therefore he couldn't possibly. I, I, I wow. said I'm probably one of four people in the country that would have caught that. Now everybody knows it. Um, but I mean, it, but they, they took pains to get the stuff right. And they get the, you, I always look at the, the, the ribbons worn by the soldiers in these sorts of things. Ah. See if they've got the precedents right. You know, they don't have them in the wrong order or anything. And, and, and I've noticed in that program, they, they got the precedence right, even though the medal may not have existed. And the wearing of the distinctive insignia on the uniform, they get, they're, they're pretty good at that sort of thing. So they, they, they pay attention to the details like that. But if you separate the fact from the fiction, then, then uh, I think it's a much more enjoyable show. And I'm looking forward to uh, the next season. Oh, yes. yes. It's not a terrible show by any means. I, I'm just saying it dragged on a, a, for a few parts there. But it picked up again after a while. Uh, definitely not yeah. a bad show to watch. And of course, now we are headed towards more of the abduction cases. And since the early 1960s, more and more people have reported not only seeing UFOs, but being abducted. And mm. one of the early cases that got me into ufology, and I credit a lot, uh, I credit ufology and the paranormal uh, to me, being able to read uh, as a as a little kid, I remember mm. just hating reading. I, I'm not into it until I discovered UFOs, the paranormal, and Bigfoot and Loch Ness monster. All those sort of things made me want to read, and that's what got mm -hmm. me hooked. And one of the cases that's always blown my mind was way back in 1966 when I believe it was 300 or not 300 about. 64 uh, school children who saw a ufo in zimbabwe mm -hmm. that's the zimbabwe ufo school sighting it's always been one of those that uh, i've always been pretty baffled by and I, yes. did, I, did i just say 1966 i meant 1994 yeah sorry about that i'm not sure why i said 66 it just rolled off my tongue there but back in 94 rather in zimbabwe that's when a bunch of school children saw this thing come from the sky and land. And I've always been baffled by that one. I'm not quite sure if you guys are familiar with that one or not. If I might jump in on that, Go ahead. that is a case that not only fascinated me, it's one I, I spoke with at length uh, with the late John Mack, who was so taken with the testimonies that he went to Zimbabwe right. and spent time with these children along with him on that trip was a good friend and close colleague of mine who also uh, was a close colleague of Bud Hopkins, uh, Randall or Randy Nickerson. Randy is a filmmaker. Um, he was so moved and taken by the story that he devoted years and years of quiet, hard work to creating something that I, I saw Randy just a few weeks ago. This is no longer a secret. Uh, so let me say it here. Um, in the next months or early next year, I don't know exactly when, um, he will be releasing officially uh, what will be the definitive biography um, um, documentary uh, on the Zimbabwe case. Wow. And in it, they revisit 
many of these young people yeah. as adults. It is brilliantly done. I've seen a lot of the rushes. Um, it is the professional quality is as fine as a Ken Burns or any PBS documentary. Uh, it has a tremendous amount of heart balanced out by the science and uh, the minutia and the detail. I think it, I don't know if it'll be a game changer, but it's not just one of the finest UFO documentaries ever made. It's an outstanding documentary that I think will have a considerable crossover audience. Again, the premiere of this, I don't know exactly when or where it's going to happen. I assume it will be in New York City, where Randy spends a good part of his year. Um, will be in the next month. So look for an announcement on that. Um, it is, if you, anybody that wants to can simply, in a quick Google search, find footage of these extremely well-spoken young people. Yeah, It is very unhysterical. The accounts are rock solid. They continue to back up each other. Um, they had nothing to gain. It is completely removed from the culture that we know and grew up in. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Michael. I think it's it's an absolutely seminally important case. It really and one, is. Again, where the anxiety factor, the fear, uh, the bad aliens, the spooky stuff is absent. It's absent. And I've tried to dismiss the case so many times throughout my lifetime here, not my long lifetime here, but you know, I've thought about it for such a long time, and I always kept thinking, you know, that's a different culture out there in Zimbabwe and all those school, all those school children uh, to get all of them to gather together and to tell that that story and get them all to agree is pretty amazing in itself. And as yes. you know, that many school children or that many kids in a group together, uh, they tell no lies. I, I would compare it on a certain level, although it's basically apples and oranges. Um, the filmmaker Jennifer Stein who did, I think, an outstanding job, and I hope Mike would agree, in creating a documentary that uh, Mike appears in, uh, I'm a talking head at a few points, uh, called Travis, the true story of Travis Walton. One of the main things that comes across to the viewer is how Mike and Travis and the other men on the logging crew went through hell in terms of sticking to their stories, having them backed up repeatedly with polygraph tests, with in accounts of their character, with accounts from the FBI on the odds of maintaining uh, a line under duress in um, repeated polygraph tests, um, it holds together in a way that if you take the time to familiarize yourself with the particulars, you really can't do what Philip Class tried to do so hard for so long, which was punch holes in it or make one of the guys cave or change their testimony, shame on him, or make them lie or be paid off. Um, these are two of the most important cases, and they do share that parallel in terms of the viability and the believability of the witnesses and the way that they're backed up. I agree, and we'll, we'll jump right into Mike's case right now, but uh, Kevin, do you have anything to add about the um, Zimbabwe sighting before we jump, I am, up, jump over? I am not that familiar with the case. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm aware of it, of course, but um, I'm not that. I, there, there's been a number of cases, I guess, similar cases. I think there was one from Australia, not all that uh, some time ago. That's sort of the same thing, where the uh, both the teachers and the students saw saw something. Uh, uh, very, very odd. So yeah, I, 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 I know which case you're talking sort of about. Nodding acquaintance with it. That one was back in 1966. That's the that's that's the reason why I mentioned that year, uh, because of that Melbourne uh, school sighting. Uh, yes, another, there yes you sir. Go. Yes. Mm -hmm. Another wild one. And Mike, go ahead if you have anything to tag before we jump into your case. Well, uh, you know the the basis of believability uh, has to hinge, you know, logically has to hinge on. A person's ability to stick to their story and 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 especially within a group and especially people who have taken lie detector tests and, and taken several lie detector tests you know the believability builds up on that and and other cases might fall apart on that in that respect but uh that is very very good the zimbabwe case is, is one of my top but you know i believe that and uh that's a hard I one much about the melbourne case but Sounds another similarity, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's, you know, a, that's a hard one to shoot shoot um, arrows through. Yes, 
And oh. yes, um, Mike, so I, I guess we, we reached the point where we will be talking about your case. And of course, a movie was actually made from the whole experience, the fire in the sky. For those that are not familiar, it hit the mainstream and audience loved it uh, all over the place. It has a, a pretty much a cult following. And of course, I'm curious what Peter thinks. Well, actually, let, let's start with you, Kevin. What do you make of the Travis Walton incident? I'm interested to hear this myself. <laughs> uh, uh, well, there I was in uh, Berlin, sitting across the table from Travis Walton. I just bring that up so I can point out that I met Travis a number of times. I um, did a book in 1997 with Bill Cohn and Russ Estes called The Abduction Enigma, where we looked at the abduction phenomena critically and uh, were greatly bothered by the number of people who claim to have a lifetime of abductions. It's happened over and over and over again. Um, I sort of reached the idea that if there was abductions going on, it would be more like the kind of thing described by Travis and Mike and his, their crew, or the Barney and Betty Hill case, kind of a target of opportunity, a one-time deal to gather the information and then head back to wherever their home world was. So, um, you know, I've looked at it from that point of view. I find it difficult to believe that six people or seven people yeah, seven would, would um, come up with this hoax and stick to it so completely and totally over so many years with so many inducements to um, recant or uh, you tell us, tell us the truth and we'll give you money. I, I think Phil Klass was at, uh, uh, offering Steve and um, $10,000 if he'd, if he would tell him, tell him the truth because Klass knew there's no alien visitation. Ergo, the, there was no abduction. Therefore you guys are all lying about it and I'm going to crack the case. Uh, Coral and Jim Lorenzen did a very a, a grave disservice to the case where they, uh, I think they had Travis undergo a um, lie detector test, polygraph test very early on and the, and the results were negative and they conspired to cover that up. And I think if you were to look at the circumstances of the way that test was conducted and by the attitudes of the guy who conducted the, the test, that it really wasn't based on what the machines were saying, but it was based on his personal bias and his um, observation of Travis's demeanor, which is not exactly the best way to do these sorts of things. So looking at the abduction phenomenon as a whole, and I think that um, you know Russ and Bill and I can explain some of the abduction phenomenon terrestrially, but there are still some cases that we look at and are just, uh, I won't speak for Bill and, and Ross, but there are some cases that I look at that just seem to me to be kind of like the Roswell case. They're they're really kind of inexplicable in terrestrial terms, and that opens the door for um, the rest of the analysis of the case. I sat down with R Travis in Roswell oh, a number of years ago and kind of talked to him a little bit about that. I sat down with Steve in Roswell and, and did an interview with him, which I put up on my blog about what he had said and how he had experienced the Phil Class um, phenomenon. And, and, and to just kind of digress for a moment, that's the one thing that's always bothered me about the debunkers is they go into the investigation knowing there's no alien visitation, ergo there is going to be a terrestrial solution. And Phil Class would make up solutions if he couldn't find a good one. Um, when I did my book, um, Encounter in the Desert about the Zamora sighting in 1964, I was able to kind of poke holes in his idea that it was a hoax created by the mayor of Ro the mayor of Roswell, mayor of Socorro and Lonnie Zamora to create a tourist attraction in Socorro. <laughs> Roswell beat him to the punch on that one. But, um, you know, I, I, you look at that sort of thing. So when Philip Class says, well, he solved a case, I have to look at the evidence to make sure it, it tracks properly. I really don't have a good ex explanation for uh, the Walton abduction. I talked to Kathleen Martin just uh, a couple of weeks ago in Roswell about the uh, Barney and Betty Hill case and a little bit about that. Uh, so I look at the, I look at the, I guess the totality of the abduction phenomena and I see the flaws in the way the research has been conducted for the last 20 years, the last 30 years. 
I, I, I look at the idea that the aliens keep seeking out the same people to look at over and over again, and they were able to pull this off with very little in the way of leaving evidence behind. And then I look at some of the the, the cases like the Walden case, like the, the Hill case, where it was just kind of a tar tar target of opportunity and um, the aliens haven't returned to bother them again. So I, I, I see that as a kind of a different different category. I would like to point out one thing. I would like to point out one thing. I am responsible for the publishing the first story where the aliens were said to have come into the house. And that was the Patty Roach abduction from 1973. And when I interviewed her in 1976 about this, um, she was talking about how the, the, the craft had landed next in the vacant field next to her house. Her house was kind of out in the uh, outskirts of, the, of a small town. And the aliens had actually come into the house to abduct her. And I think that's the first time that was ever printed. So I, I take full responsibility for that attitude. Mm -hmm. That's my yeah. take on it, Mike. I hope I didn't offend you. No, no, not at all. I'm a realist. And uh, I, after reading a lot of your stuff, and especially this article that you sent, uh, I, uh, I can see that you're very much a realist and you've got your head on your shoulders and you're not biased. Uh, that is very refreshing to me because there is so much bias in the UFO community. And that's another reason why I picked uh, Peter uh, Robbins here is because he is, even though he's a believer like me, uh, he very much got his head on his shoulders and he is not, you know, a biased thinker. Uh, well, you can you can see that with, with, with Peter when he sort of repudiates his book. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's a very difficult thing for a writer to do. I mean, you pour a lot of time and effort into telling a story that you think is true based on what people are telling you. And it turns out that uh, your main source is probably not the most honest person in the world. Uh, by the way, I, I have muted Peter on accident here uh, in case he was trying to talk and I'm, I'm trying to unmute him. And it seems like I can't unmute him all of a sudden. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know what the hell happened. Well, just to, to, to fill the <laughs> air for a moment while you try to figure out the problem. Um, you know, I got caught up in this latest kerfuffle over Larry Warren's tale of being involved in the Bentwaters case. And it all came about is because uh, Philip Mantle had published, I guess, on Facebook, um, an interview that had been conducted by Linda Moulton Howe and somebody else. I always want to say Ben Johnson, and I know that's not right, with Larry Warren. And when Larry Warren said that he had appropriated one of the stories of one of the other guys in the unit because, uh, um, you know, he hadn't been directly involved and he wanted to get the story out. So he kind of um, appropriated this guy's story. And, and Philip Mendel says, does anybody else know anything about this? And I had a tape that was conducted on, uh, on, on, on I'm looking up the date right now, on uh, February 16th, 1993 with Peter Robbins, um, um, Larry Warren, Charles Holt, and I guess Bob Osler was there uh, about this, where, where Warren says some things that suggest he wasn't involved. And so, you know, you look at all of that sort of thing, and, and I was um, uh, just put that out for, for Philip, and he published it on that, and so Larry Warren's now mad at me as well. <laughs> but I, I, think it's, I think it's a, um, you know, a tribute to Peter that he would he he would say you know i've learned these things about this story i'm very bothered by this story and here are the facts as i now understand them i went sort of a similar thing with um with frank kaufman in the roswell case who was telling us wonderful stuff and providing us with documentation and uh, we eventually learned that he was making it all up as he but went along when we got his military record it didn't reflect what he had told us uh, we found that, uh, and I shouldn't say we, I think it was Don Schmidt, Mark Rodiger, and uh, Mark Chesney who found in um, Kaufman's house, it, after Kaufman died, Juanita, his wife, had asked them, because they were in Roswell, if there was any contracts or anything that, that Frank was obligated to fulfill, and she wanted to make sure all that would have been done, and they were going through his office, and they found an old typewriter, they found stacks of this paper from the 1940s, you know, with buy war bonds on it and that sort of thing, and that how he had created some of this documentation. We got his original discharge papers from the military, and it didn't reflect the papers that he had given us. So it's a very hard thing to say, you know, I blew it on this one. Uh, Kevin, hold right? hold on one one moment here. I'm going to bring oh, okay. I'm going to bring Peter on. Hold that thought. Yes, I'm sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen, bringing in 
Uh, Peter Robbins here. I'm not quite sure what happened. I, I muted poor Peter and he got kicked off and now I think he's back on. I'm back. There you go. <laughs> we were just putting you over. <laughs> well, well, what I was what I was saying, Peter, um, uh, you know, I was I don't know how much of that you heard, but I was pointing out that you know I I, I found it very admirable that that you had repudiated your book um, after you learned the facts about mm -hmm. the case. I was I, that's very a very difficult thing for a writer to do that you spend all that time and effort in 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 gathering the data and you think the data is accurate and you think the people are telling you the, the truth and and to discover. That that's not the case, and it's very, very difficult for a writer to say, "Hey, you know, um, I blew it on this one. I'm sorry, people." Um, well, thank you. Um, you're absolutely right in terms of the difficulty, the humiliation. Um, I spent more than a year um, seeking out people and apologizing for helping to mislead them on a very important case. The fact is, um, I've heard it on both sides of the equation that I have disavowed the book Left at Eastgate. The fact is, there are hundreds of parts of that 500-page book that I will always be proud of and always stand by. There are, I don't know, about 300 fully annotated, fact-checked, footnoted annotations. There is my own account, which I stand by, except where I... <laughs> accepted the account of somebody who, um, to be blunt, is a pathological liar and a sociopath. Um, I, I, am not... I, already, I already outed him. Yeah. I don't know if you heard that. I already outed him on that. There's a lot Good. of uh, pathological, neurological liars out there. Well, and, I, I have to I say... I mentioned, I mentioned that one of the things I had done recently that got me dragged into the fight with this, yeah. the recent fight on this, was um, I have a copy of a tape with a conversation... Oh, with yes. Paul. Yes. On February 16th, 1993, that I guess involved you and, and Larry That's Warren, right. and Charles Halt, and Bob Osler. That's right. I was an absolute true believer at that time and 100% behind Larry's account. I was his primary defender, champion. Uh, my reputation, everything was on it. And a lot of folks don't know, I wrote two follow up books supporting that same view. One that was published criticizing very heavily. Uh, former deputy base commander of RAF Bent Waters, um, um, Chuck Hall, and the other criticizing um, somebody who I had counted for years as a very good friend and close um, um, colleague, um, Nick Pope, who a lot of people love to put down. Um, and that friendship imploded uh, because of Larry Warren. Um, I'm glad to say both Charles Hall and Nick are bigger men than um, to allow my errors to stand in the way of uh, being generous with their understanding and apologies. And I, I uh, hope that I can make good on um, their largesse. Um, but you know what? I've been through worse. I watched my sister die. Um, I, I have more important things to do than dwell on this. It's now several years in the past. And although it's still a very active thing, Larry continues to insist he will never back down. He can't allow himself to be seen for what he is. There is a documentary coming out very shortly, I understand, called Capel Green, which will probably quote me quite heavily nice. from that period of time. Uh, somebody who I considered a, a good friend and close colleague in the UK, uh, Gary Haseltine, has essentially taken over my old role. Uh, because I did such a good job of promoting Warren's inaccuracies uh, and backing them up in so many ways. Um, these things happen, and you can allow them to eat you up. You can um, stand your ground in a macho way and, um, you know, um, deny the lies or uh, blame somebody else or accept responsibility, clean it up as well as you can, and move on and hopefully contribute to the work that, that means a lot to you. And in my case, um, it's ufology. I, I have never understood the attitude where if I learn that I've made a mistake mm. somewhere, and I was using the example of Frank Kaufman, that it I, I somehow have to defend Frank Kaufman, yeah. even though I now know the truth about him. And I've never understood that idea. I think that in ufology especially, because it's <laughs> such a... Um, diverse and fragmented field <laughs> that we need to um, 
expose these sorts of things yeah. as quickly as possible. And and look at the charlatans running around in the field. Um, oh, good Lord. Uh, I, I was thinking of uh, my friend Noah Torres, who uh, wrote a book called The Other Roswells about the yes. real UFO crash, and, yes. and Robert Willingham. Yeah. And everybody's, and I, I, I was doing Crash, and I was going to include that story in it. So I, I just searched on the internet, what's new in it, and found their book and found the new story, and then discovered, uh, you know, it's it's radically altered from where it had been before. It's it's <laughs> changed, and that's it, it, Willingham's fault, changing the story. Um, and so I I was doing additional research on that, and I said, well, Willingham was never an Air Force officer. And people said, well, we have a picture of him from the 1960s in an Air Force officer oh, uniform. Gosh. And I looked at the picture. They sent me the picture, and I said, no, nah, it's Civil Air Patrol. Oh. Not the same thing. Oh. They did they because I had been a Civil Air Patrol cadet. I recognized it immediately. And then he was in pictures of him in other uniforms, but the distinctive insignia, the U.S. was missing. From the he'd taken it off before the picture was taken, and he was wearing ribbons that were the Civil Air Patrol ribbons plus military ribbons, which he never earned, by the way. Mm. But but in the Civil Air Patrol, you know, you can wear your military awards and decorations. They take higher precedence than the, than the Civil Air Patrol one. But if but you do not wear your Civil Air Patrol ribbons on a military uniform. So I was able to to uh, expose that. I actually found the original story he told in 1968 about it. But but. <sighs> You know, and I, I, I got into um, a discussion. I won't call it a fight. It was discussion. We civilly discussed the Willingham case. Yeah, like a good fight every now and then. Um, and and I think that Noah Torres has realized that Willingham wasn't telling them the truth. We were able to get the documentation to prove that. He, he said, well, he retired as a lieutenant colonel from the Air Force. The only military record I could find, he'd been, a, uh, been an E-4 in the Army. He was technically a veteran of World War II. He had joined the Army in December of 1945, and uh, the war was continued, considered over in 1946. So if you served any time between, b b prior to the summer of 1946, you were considered a veteran of World War II. So he kind of sneaked in under that one. Ah. But um, the documentation, when I could get it from a source other than him, did not reflect the documents he was handing out. And so, I mean, here's another case, and I think Noah Torres uh, wrote it with Ruben Yarte, and I know Noah, Noah if they were going to reprint the book, and Noah said, no, we can't do that. He just, he wouldn't do it. He, he understood that we had nailed the information down. And I, I guess the point simply is there are an awful lot of people in the UFO community who claim military service that they do not have and military rank they did not earn. And I say to anybody, if you want to check my record out, have at it, pal, because it's Amazing. all there. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I can prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, so I don't worry about that. But but there's a need, I think, as you were saying, Peter, of people to inject themselves into stories to make their um, role greater than it might have been had they been. Obviously, he was at Bentwaters in, in 1980. He was there during the event. Yes. He just wasn't a participant in the event. That's my best understanding now. And, and and on the tape that that you're you're present for, where he's talking about seeing the thing explode and all that, the lights burning his eyes, and and Halt says you weren't in front of us. The only people in front of me were Peniston and Burroughs. Well, he also says, uh, among many other things, that over forty men were involved in that particular event, and yet not one single man is standing forward to say, "Yes, I was there." Yes, it's like you say, um, his event. If it happened, he was not there. The thing is, I don't even know at this point what to believe because his lying is so skillful and so indiscriminate and so scattershot. Some of it absolutely profoundly important. Some of it about the most minor details. Um, some people can just play with the truth like that. The original question, though, about how how do people do that? I think it has to do with how we're brought up. Sounds like um, um, sounds like narcissism. Well, I, I think it's textbook narcissism in that sense. Oh yeah. And he will be your best friend, and you know, hail fellow well met until you present him with court level evidence mm. of his duplicity, and then you are a troll. You're part of the problem. You're part of the you know group of people that have always been trying to bring him down. Um, 
one of the ironies is that although, again, his whole thing is based on whole cloth, he decided this is the way I'm going to become well known. And for years kept talking about the event when nobody else would. So we have an irony here of him being a genuine whistleblower of an event that I maintain that he was not involved in. That's, for me, a small point. The fact is, he has attacked viciously, viciously, people who have called him on this. And I would say for anybody who wants even a basic introduction to what happened here, go to my website, Peter Robbins NY, as in New York, PeterRobbinsNY.com, and there is a paper posted there. It's been there for over two years, front and center. It will give you an idea of what came crashing in around me at that time. Uh, and frankly, I haven't even reread it since that time. Um, I have fully moved on, and um, I have not been in any contact with him for about two and a half years. And if I never am again, that's fine with me. Understood. Um, yeah. Life goes on. Life well, does I, go on. I, since, since you're plugging your website, yeah, uh, go ahead, mine's www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. <laughs> and if you type Peter Robbins into the search engine, you'll you'll see the paper as well. You yes. You granted me permission to put it up on my blog because I thought it was an important document that we totally. get out. I would also say that if you listen to that, you will hear Peter Robbins, um, somebody who heart and soul believes what he is saying about the person whose story he is trying to help tell and has bought it hook, line, and sinker. Um, the sincerity in my voice is absolutely authentic. And um, more than that, I can't say. I, I think it's important that it stand on its own for what it is. Um, when I was approached about writing this book with him, uh, by him in 1987, I had been involved in the work for about a dozen years. My involvement happened overnight when my sister related to me her memory of her childhood abduction. My friendship with Bud Hopkins clicked in about a year later, five years before he published his first book, uh, Missing Time, a seminally important book uh, on the abduction phenomena. Right. Uh, I was immersed in that world for many years and by that time was looking for a book length project. And what I did investigate as far down as I drilled came up good. The small discrepancies I let go, uh, the fact that I felt he had post-traumatic stress, uh, had been, you know, gone at by the best of them. Uh, he's very heroic. I now realize was something that I created in my mind. He simply was looking for somebody like me of goodwill, who was willing to take him seriously, who would drill down but not drill down as far as they should have. And when this started to be brought to my attention three years ago, that 30 years ago, I was not the investigator that I am now. Of course and not. And once again, yeah. I did want to believe him. I never met anybody so sincerely involved in what they were putting forward, at least verbally. Um, and I stuck with him for all those years because I felt that story was an important story to tell. And when I realized it had fallen apart and that I could allow my reputation to fall apart with it as opposed to go through the prolonged embarrassment of a very public apology and um, essentially changing my position on it, there really was no choice. You it's took a pleasant, you, you took a lot of heat by the well, that's you, what I did. You took a lot of heat by the way, Peter. Did I ever? Ooh. Yeah, man. Yeah, well, I certainly wish that Peter Davenport could have that opinion, that that attitude, because uh, he considers me an apostate. Uh, just because I came up with something concerning the Phoenix Lights that just isn't mainstream. It's entirely new, but it's entirely factual. Wait, and hold on, Mike. Hold on, Mike. It just, just well, didn't fit. Mike, one second. Before we jump right into the Phoenix Lights, I just want to wrap up the Travis Walton experience that happened back in 1975. Um, Peter and Kevin, are you in the same notion and belief that for five days... Travis Walton was missing. Do you believe that wholeheartedly? I am. I, I, I will jump in as somebody who worked on and off for five years on this documentary with Travis and with Jennifer. 
Um, as Mike knows, uh, I had the privilege of returning to the site of the events in the Sitgrave National Forest, a wilderness area that covers parts of three states. A lot of folks don't realize how deep into it they were at this moment. I, I would say in legal terminology, I am convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that Travis was authentically missing for 10 days, that he was somewhere else, and that non-human intelligences were most certainly involved. That's my personal conclusions. Amazing. I, Go ahead, Kevin. I have no doubt he was missing. I mean, it's kind of like the Roswell case where we all agree something crashed. Something crashed, yeah. You know, we don't know what it was, but something crashed. Uh, we have clearly Travis was missing for a, a number of days. Five days. And, Five days. Yeah, that's what I thought, but Peter had said 10. Yeah. Um, but he was clearly missing for a number of days. And Five he could have, he could have, I said number. Oh. <laughs> and and five is a number. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where I'm going here. It's getting late here in It's Iowa. getting late. We're almost uh, done here. Don't worry. <laughs> Not here. Uh, anyhow, um, Travis, Travis was clearly missing for a number of days. He comes back with a wonderful story uh, about the whole event. And then we get the people with the agendas looking at it. Mm. Jim Lynn, Carl Lorenzen, and I, I really can't say enough good things about them because they were very helpful to me at the beginning of my career and uh, inadvertently helped me pay for college. I say, that, say this because I, I went to the University of Iowa on what I called my Saga scholarship. Saga magazine was doing the UFO report. And about every time my U-bill was due, my tuition was due, I'd get paid for a story I'd written there. And a lot of times the information came from Kim, Jim and Carl Lorenzen, so they were very, very helpful. But they were completely and totally in the in the extraterrestrial camp. Um, they did some fine work, but they also they also had their biases, and I, I think that kind of colored their their investigations in some arenas. But um, you know, and I, I think that they made a tactical error with the polygraph exam, the first polygraph examination in the Travis Walton case, which gave Philip Class ammunition to run with. Well, how come you're hiding the first polygraph? He failed the first polygraph. Well, yeah, but didn't he like pass a whole bunch of others? Um, so yes, that's true. It's what's um, mo after multiple polygraph tests, only one person had a bit of a shaky uh, test result. But yeah, it was and, just and, one and person. The guy had a bias. The guy was, the guy knew the the guy knew the story had to be fake. Well, so, he certainly did have a bias. I interviewed. No, him. no, I I have to disagree with you, Kevin. As far as him had, knowing that the story had to be fake, uh, he was the one who had had some trouble with the law, and as as Mike knows better than I, yeah. did not want to go through any kind of police procedure that might catch him up on something that had nothing to do with the events in question. Yeah. So anyway, um, well, you know, I, as I said, uh, I think a couple times tonight that my opinion is if alien abduction is a real thing, it is probably more likely as a target of opportunity, a single event rather than an ongoing longitudinal study of some kind. And so I look at it that way. I've talked to now three of the people. I actually, I met Mike Rogers at, in Roswell. It may have been in 1997. It was um, on the 50th anniversary. Yeah, okay. Then I, cool. I met you there briefly. We chatted momentarily. I went to your I went to your presentation um, about it. And like I said, I met I've met Travis there a couple of times, and I met him once in Germany when we were we were invited there to uh, to speak. And uh, you know, I've just I look at the case and I I don't I don't have a good solution for it. I can't say it's a fake, it's a hoax, or anything else, especially. You've got multiple witnesses and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I have, that's kind of where I am. So we're on that's a kind of a wishy-washy answer, I know. But that's okay. I'm just, I'm just sort of, the, the, the whole abduction phenomenon bothers me immensely. It really does, yeah. And, and um, yeah, I knew Bud Hopkins, talked about Bud Hopkins. We argued about abductions. Um, same thing with John Mack. Um, I've been in touch with Carol Rainey, Bud's ex-wife. Uh, about uh, her take on it. So, you know, I've, I've got some inside information there. Uh, Carol's not... main intent is to destroy Bud's reputation after the fact. And this is something that we will have to uh, agree to disagree on, Kevin. Um, no, I'm just I... looking at the evidence. I'm just looking at the evidence that, well, that 
I, I, I did too, but much more close up, much more in depth and a great deal more evident. This, um, there are so many areas where uh, I can't hold a candle to the extraordinary amount of research, publishing um, specific investigations you've been involved in. But this one, um, the subject of legitimate abductions, um, again, you and I will have to agree to disagree on. I haven't ruled it out. In fact, I interestingly, um, I was asked to review Bud's book uh, when it came out. And so we corresponded a, a number of times about the book. Sure. Um, which I found fascinating, by the way. Uh, but I, um, I think there are there are terrestrial explanations for some of the some of the cases of alien abduction. I think they, and I mentioned the Pat Roach case. I am absolutely convinced that Pat Roach suffered a, 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 a case of sleep paralysis. Interesting. And that induced and that induced the entire alien abduction thing into her, uh, into her mindset. She had read, read an article I had written uh, about uh, uh, UFO abduction, and she wrote the publisher um, to tell her that she knew she knew how some of this stuff do, went, and they sent me the letter and, and paid for me to go out to Utah to interview her and that sort of thing. I took Jim Harder with me, um, which was, it ended up to be a tactical error. I should have found somebody who was a little more competent in his mm -hmm. research techniques. But um, and it, but what his his mission in life, as we talk about bias, his mission in life was to validate the Barney and Betty Hill case. And so we would have a hypnotic regression session with Pat Roach and gather the information. And then we'd go off and we'd chat about this. And at one point, Arter said that Betty Hill had been a, been examined while on board the, the craft and talked a little bit about that. And by God, in the next hypnotic regression session, Pat Roach said that she didn't remember being uh, examined, but she knew she was. And I'm thinking, well, there's a case of leading the witness. Well, Not I have to say, leader. I have no familiarity with the case that you're discussing, so. Um, Bud, I, Hopkins I have... mentioned it. Bud Hopkins mentioned it in his book, <laughs> no, but didn't um... mention me. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yes. and. We are coming to a close very soon here, so now it is that time to talk about the Phoenix Lights as our uh, main event here. And uh, Mike has a lot Didn't to... did that ship sort of sail? <laughs> I, right. <laughs> but yes, now we will talk about the Phoenix Lights incident. And it's one of those that always made me scratch my head, seeing that as a little boy uh, next to my father... And I, I clearly remember him smiling about it because he's always been into the whole thing. And for many, this was the first mass sighting, but for others, not so much. And Mike, are, are, Mike, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I was hoping you'd jump in there. Oh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't hear the cue. <laughs> That's okay. Now I have footage uh, for those in the chat room of the lights uh, forming above the sky there. And that's a very famous footage. For those that were watching the news, you see these objects uh, sort of line up. Some say they were flares. Other people don't believe so. Mike, what's your take? Well, you're talking about two different events here. Two different events, right. Yes. And the one, the one that all the photographs are of the uh, lights uh, uh, supposedly in front of South Mountain or in front of the Estrella Mountains uh, has been really conclusively proven to be flares. Uh, and, and that's the one event, it's called the second event, uh, that uh, is, is made so much about. But that was, that was flares. Now, I'm pretty sure that Kevin thinks that, too. Oh, and, yeah. And, uh, I mean, that's backed up by the U.S. Air Force and a whole lot of, of – uh, I've done a whole lot of study. You know, I haven't done any kind of research, really, on, on things other than just reading things over the years. I haven't done personal research that uh, – these guys have concerning all this other stuff. But uh, what I have done is thoroughly investigated the Phoenix lights that started my witnessing of it that very night and uh, up in Prescott, Arizona. And then, uh, you know, I, you know, it started out with me standing there on a hill, uh, actually trying to get video of the uh, hale Bob Comet. And uh, the one thing I remember the most is that the, uh, the object was solid. It wasn't lights separate by themselves with, with nothing in between, like like on airplanes or something. You know, when I first saw this thing, there was still a tinge of twilight in the sky. 
And uh, even if there, even if when there isn't a twilight involved, the, the night sky, especially in the mountains, is not pitch black. It's dark blue. I think I might have to disagree with you on the whole flare thing, to be honest with you, since the fact that I live next to a naval facility and there is a testing range out here, I have seen flares multiple times, but I've never seen flares do that, what they do in this video, uh, where they align that sort of way, and they don't exactly fall as quickly as the other flares that I've seen in the past. Uh, that's one thing that I do scratch my head at, and I'm sure you've probably heard that plenty of times. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. The thing is, the thing is that, that those flares were dropped 70 miles away, and, and uh, the uh, believers of, the, of that incident being an extraterrestrial craft, there is so much coincidence that disproves that, as well as scientific evidence that, that disproves that, I mean, proves that there are flares and not something else. And uh, one of those things is simple. You're talking about something 70 miles away. And most people don't understand that bright glaring lights always appear much, much closer than they really are. Just take, for instance, headlights. If you've ever been on an open stretch of highway and you see headlights off in the distance, uh, say a mile away, they're, they appear much, much larger than they actually are. In fact, they will totally engulf their host vehicle. Even, even a Mack truck, uh, it's, it's totally gone behind the, the size of those lights. And that's at a mile away. And if you, if you see, ever have an opportunity to look at headlight on a dark highway five miles away, my gosh, if you actually know other five miles away and you compare the size that they appear, they're actually hundreds of times larger than the vehicle that they're producing them. Uh, and I have many, many examples of that. You know, uh, and I don't want any of that you know, other right now, but those, those lights that everybody thought was uh, an alien vehicle, first of all, they they uh they were lights that that uh, took on a shape sort of, <laughs> and it's not just the fact that the air force came forward and said that they were flares, and a sense proven that that's what they were in demonstrations in the very same place, and and uh, Dr. Lynn Cate says that's nonsense. They didn't. They didn't take on the same shape as they did before. Oh, Mike, I have to jump in here and just quickly say it's too bad we don't have Dr. Lynn, who was scheduled to be here tonight, uh, boys and girls. And uh, she, I don't know what happened. She sort of just um, disappeared on us. Yeah, I kind of know what happened, but I won't get into that. <laughs> That's okay. I was trying to get you to say, but go ahead. <laughs> well, well let, me, let me just jump in on the, on the lights thing. If anybody's ever been shot at by tracers... <laughs> they're always well, really, really big, and they're always really coming right at you. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was one, really that was one thing I noticed. <laughs> How much bigger were they than, than they actually are? Well, they looked <laughs> they looked like they were uh, a size of oranges coming at you. <laughs> no, it it uh, it's a, a seven point six two round is not that big, but the tracer the the glow from the tracer makes it look like it's the size of an orange, and you hear guys talking about it. Well, those tracers are the size of watermelon, so mm -hmm. <laughs> just a matter of perception. Well, it, it is all a matter of perception. That's what we're talking about here. You know, not in addition to that, the fact that those flares looked much larger, looked so large that they looked much closer. Uh, in addition to that, there's all kinds of, of, of coincidence going on there. These so-called uh, lights of, a, of an alien craft appeared in the very same spot that, it, that flares would have been in, assuming that they were flares, or, or the fact that they were flares. Uh, the, the very same spot of sky, and I have measured that out. I've been up on that hill where Dr. Lynn lives. And uh, it, it's uh, 40 degrees wide at the most, and 20 degrees above the horizon at the most. And, and those lights appeared there many times in the past, and nobody explained them before, except... Dr. Lynn, maybe, <laughs> she tried to. And one time in a foggy sky, she said they were orbs that were 100 feet or so close to her house. Uh, that's just all atmospheric uh, creation. But uh, the, the, the fact that these lights that she kept talking about at various times, at various times of year, and various, various uh, people, they were always in the same place. You know how much sky there is otherwise? There was, a, there was a whole sky above and behind and around, uh, but they were always in that particular location. Now, why is that? And that's not just the only thing. 
These things that they call lights just happen to be the same size as flares, and they endured for the same amount of time. It was, it was just a very few minutes that those, that those stayed above the Estrellas, actually behind the Estrellas in reality, and, uh, and, and they slowly, they, they appeared to be in place, but something 70 miles away, and we're talking parachute flares here, which are held basically in, in space by the fact that the flare underneath is creating heat that, create, that makes the parachute stay where it is, sometimes even rise, and, and, and they only start slowly drifting down when the, when the flare starts dimming out. And that's all evident in all those films. Mike, you're going to piss people off again here. Oh, I'm, I piss <laughs> people off all the time concerning the Phoenix Lights. Yeah, the first, I, time, the first time we did that interview, people went crazy. Yeah, they sure did. That's amazing. <laughs> well, he's not going to piss me off because I think the lights were flares too. So yeah, you, you think go. they're flares. And uh, 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 one second, Peter, do you think those are flares too? I don't think so. At the same time, um, the only reason I'm here regarding this case is I have tremendous admiration and respect for Mike. He asked me to read an um, uh, extraordinarily detailed piece of research that um, he wrote on this. Uh, I also um, spent as equal amount of time reading a very fine paper by Kevin on the Phoenix Lights, and I'm I'm damned if I know. I, I did have a moment, Mike, reading your paper early on where I got to the point where, and I say this as somebody who is deeply dyslexic it, numerically. Some people are with words. The, the sentence was, the bias equation, 16 OIQ times bias equals IQ 061 virtual math. I, I thought, oh, no. <laughs> I, I, I'm in real trouble here. <laughs> Uh, Bas read... Basically, that's a joke. Yes. I... <laughs> virtual math, you know. I know. Everything's I virtual know. to me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... And the math, of course, is not math. It's, it's just I, a, I guess it's I'm a, a good example know. of somebody in the work who remembers when this case broke. Um, Dr. Lin, of course, was a leading researcher in it. I, I read her book. Um, I, I was fascinated by the variety of the, I felt, very credible accounts of, of people all over the greater Phoenix area, <clears throat> none who seemed to have an ax to grind or, uh, you know, were in it for the money or anything like that. And I came away after reading both of these papers thinking, uh, and, and Kevin made me laugh earlier with that wonderful, and again, you know, sometimes the things that come out of left field that are come, come to us from just let's throw that against the wall and see if it sticks. The idea of, mm -hmm. all right, here's the way that we're kind of going to edge into introducing ourselves to humanity in what we'll laughingly call modern times is we'll have one of our things go down and we'll look fallible. And that will be the starting point over the next 50, 70, 100 years that, you know, we'll, we'll gain traction uh, in the conscious mind of these human beings. I thought to myself, is it possible? Bearing in mind, you know, the work that you did, Mike, backing up the exact wind speed and the weather, that even though we have no record of any account like this in the whole history of UFO studies that I'm aware of, that a giant honking triangular craft from who knows where comes in over the southwest, says, hmm, let's mess around with these folks in the greater Phoenix area, of course, UFO sightings are, are fairly common now for the human race, but let's give them one that we won't forget, like the Stevensville one, very big, and go at the exact speed of the wind. So when somebody figures out that this phenomena was moving at that speed, they will draw the logical deduction that it was being carried by the wind and you know, um, really mess with their minds that way. Uh, I think I will make no friends with that theory. Um, I am immediately disavowing it. Uh, but once again, this is almost emblematic of what the hell happened? What went on? Uh, I, I came away from reading both papers thinking, I'm, I'm more perplexed by this now than I ever was. It was much easier just to accept 
a giant honking triangle and these wonderful personal accounts of this person in this car at this location and these folks looking up from their home and on and on as we do with a, a major account right. that was witnessed from a number of points by a number of different people um, with, with no commonality except for that. Yes. So, so, Mike, you're saying that these were just flares. So we'll just say they're flares. But what exactly were people seeing above their homes? There were a lot of eyewitness testimony that not just one person and not just by five, but a big majority of people saw something in the sky that was massive. What what was that? Well, again, you're talking two different incidents. The second event, which is the lights above the Estrellas, that's in cl completely different. That's been proven to be flares, and I, I've shown all, sides of, uh, all sorts of other evidence that, it, that they were flares. Uh, but the, the first event, which is what I call my paper that I've written, the first event was completely different. That was not flares. <laughs> that was something else, and it was something very genuine. Now, my basic concept on that is it was something created by man, either either the Air Force or, or somebody private. Uh, and I have no idea why they would do that, except that, that, that all the evidence seems to point that way. However, in addition, I will say this. Since I, all I know of, of it is that the wind is, is in alignment with the object, because we have this document that uh, was paste, placed on the Internet from uh, Peter Davenport, and the actual exact path of the object as, as described by hundreds, thousands of people, is exactly in line with the wind, the, the wind documentation that has always existed since the beginning. And uh, all I can say is this. There was an alignment of the object to the wind, including elevation, speed, and direction. And it was a kind of a reverse S shape down across Arizona. And that's, that's uh, really fact. I mean, uh, if you consider... All these people, these thousands of people saying what they saw and what, which direction was going and everything, and you combine that with the actual documentation from the Weather Service, uh, of which there's many, many pieces of documentation that all coincide with that, uh, you have to come away with the idea that uh, this pretty much is fact. I mean, it's not a theory, really. But what is a theory is what it was. And uh, I, I will admit, although it's not my pet theory, that it could have been extraterrestrial, just like you said a while ago, uh, just playing with us, going the exact speed, direction, elevation, everything of the wind. Uh, but, you know, in, in truth, I can say, just like Occam's razor, what's more likely? First of all, we can't even explain aliens or, or extraterrestrials. Uh, you know, Kevin Randall here doesn't even, he doesn't really say anything for sure about anything that I know of. Uh, he's not really a skeptic, but he's uh, kind of open-minded, and his open mind is that uh, certain things are and certain things aren't. He says that the, the, the flares were the second event, which I agree with. But as far as the first event's concerned, it's not really likely that it was an, an alien craft just deciding to play with people's heads about it. Uh, more likely is it was something that the Air Force created or something created by private uh, or some sort of a hoax well, that's or possible maybe too. something that uh, was meant for something else right we don't know you about yet that's a that's a possibility um peter go ahead um i'm not sure where to go from where i ah, I, I just I, said i was in uh, i was referencing uh toward towards all the sightings of an object overhead in the residential area yeah um mm -hmm. again at a certain point for me um, one has to say, after X number of people, um, a good, uh, I, I don't know what the tipping point is, but this father, this mother, these kids, um, Lynn, uh, bless her heart, you know, who lived in the area and looked up and she saw it from her home in the hills, um, that these people come forward, put their accounts uh, on the record, we know now, even though he made extraordinary fun of it at the time, extremely mean-spirited fun, that then Governor Fife Symington yeah, the governor. was a witness to it as well. And um, the way that he dealt with it, which was, as far as I'm concerned, unconscionable. Um, you make fun of people who have had the courage to come forward and say, this is sincerely what I feel I saw. 
Um, he said, you know, made a little announcement with a smirk and then brought out one of his assistants in an alien mask. Ten years later, the journalist Leslie Kane did an interview with Symington, and he admitted it and as much as apologized, but ten years after the fact. I, I think that uh, the phenomena reported to um, paraphrase General Twining's famous statement from September of 1947 – was real and not something visionary or fictitious. Was it a huge machine uh, moving at the same speed as the wind um, under intelligent control from parts unknown, or was it another kind of phenomenon? One that, as Mike takes great pains to lay out in a very disturbing well-researched paper, and I say disturbingly, because for folks that have a fair amount invested in what we'll call the accepted view, um, there's obviously, who is this guy? Well, we know who he is, of course, and uh, he's got a bully pulpit here to address the field because he's Mike Rogers, the crew chief uh, during the Travis Walton event. But how dare he mess with, you know, uh, my theory and the published work and what people generally accept. How dare you, Mike? <laughs> well, the thing of it is, is that I, I need to ask this question. Uh, you know, what I'm saying about being carried on the wind, if it was a man-made object, how would people know the difference? You know, that being carried on the wind, which is a, basically proven, is, is, does not put down anybody's uh, witnessing of it. It doesn't change anybody's uh, account whatsoever. So just because, you know, uh, 5,000 or 10,000 or however many people saw that object, it doesn't change what they said. It doesn't, it does, and, and they think that it was extraterrestrial. It, it doesn't deviate from that. It just says that, well, this object was obviously carried on the wind. And what do you think of that? Because I am not putting down all these other people. I witnessed it myself. And it definitely was a solid object. And, uh, you know, uh, People do that, they, you know, just like Peter just did. They say, uh, well, the common idea, and, the, and all these people said this and this, is as if what I'm saying is counter to that. And what I'm saying is not counter to that. It's just simply bringing out some facts about it that don't have anything to do with what people witnessed, except mm. that they apparently witnessed something wrong, at least in the, in the, in the case of what it actually was. Yeah. Right. I think yeah. we can all agree that something, well, something was in the sky. Oh, Boy, and something yeah, big. Yeah, yeah, now that is where it comes, all those people come into. You know, so many witnesses, there was something definitely in the sky. Something was there, that's true. We can all agree and on it that. It definitely went a certain way, and it did a certain thing. And, it, and uh, you know, that cannot be uh, put down. That's just the way it was. That does not say that it was extraterrestrial. That's true. I, I can agree with you on that one. And uh, what a year 1997 was for ufology, by the way. Oh, yeah. yeah the, whole, the whole hell bop thing was incredible. That leads into the Heaven's Gate incident. Yes. Yes. Um, let me just quickly insert here that in February of 1997, uh, the book Left at East Gate had just been published here in the States. Uh, my co author and I were speaking at that year's conference in Gulf Breeze, Florida. And we were doing our first book signing at a conference, which, as any author knows, is an exciting moment. Right. There was a, a long line of people um, with the book coming up to us and I'm trying to be as professional as I could. Would you like me to sign that or inscribe it when what you really wanted to do is grab them by the arm and scream, thank you for buying my book? But it seems so much less professional. <laughs> and a gentleman stepped in front of me, and I will never forget. I looked up, and I... I don't know if my jaw dropped, but there was something about his face. I thought he was in his mid-70s, a lot of lines, a psychological term, flat affect, not a hint of an expression, um, wearing very neutral colored clothes, close-cropped gray hair, a little cap, and I asked him, and he said in a monotone, just sign, I signed my name, and right behind him was essentially his mini-me. Uh, a 20-something, dressed the same way, haircut, same haircut, um, answered the question in the same monotone. A week later, we all learned that um, the 
head of the cult uh, of Heaven's Gate, uh, a man named Marshall Applewhite, right. had ordered his followers, I think there were 43 of them, uh, his terminology as the cult leader was to drop their bodies so that they could then travel to the spaceship in the tail of the hale Bop Comet and then go on to their destiny uh, in, in their next life. And it was, in fact, Marshall Applewhite. Less than a week before, he basically ordered his followers to murder him themselves, and he killed himself, buying a copy of that book. And I received, I was actually staying at Bud Hopkins' uh, home at the time, because I was living uh, upstate briefly for a few years, and got a call that morning that I needed to get to the publisher down on Lower Broadway immediately. Walked into the offices and everybody stopped what they were doing. Apparently, the night before, um, a CBS news magazine, if I remember correctly, it is uh, some years back now, um, that Dan Rather had, I think it was like a half hour sort of 60 minutes kind of treatment, but like on an off night Tuesday night or something, had been the first news team allowed into the building. And whether or not the members of the cult had done this or whether the police did it or the news people do it, did it, we'll never know. But on the communal coffee table sat four books, a copy of Bud Hopkins' Intruders, Timothy Good's Above Top Secret, both published 10 years before, um, Whitley Strieber's uh, Communion, also published 10 years before, all three of them 1987, and the newly published and inscribed a week before copy of Left at East Gate. And reporters were calling from all over the country, are you ready for this, to find out what the connection was. Connection between Heaven's Gate and East Gate. And I spent hours on the phone taking calls from news people around the country and with increasing frustration, explaining there was no connection. And at a certain point, really went off on some reporter and said, do you ever hear Watergate? Gate, it's a word. This is a coincidence. We had nothing to do with the Heaven's Gate cult, et cetera. That was the first blast of publicity that that book got. Um, but to look in that man's eyes and then after the fact, realize who he was and what he was about to do, um, cult mentality, unfortunately, we're seeing more of it in modern America than less right now, and it served me tremendously. Uh, the giving yourself over to something because you want to believe or because you have nothing to believe in, and you're that easily manipulated, uh, dangerous as it can possibly be. Exactly my take. Very dangerous. You know, promoting the wrong thing concerning ufology is criminal in my opinion. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, Kevin, anything to add to that? Uh, there really isn't anything to add to that. You know, um, this this whole idea that you can convince people they're going to reach another plane, mm. uh, yes. committing suicide is God. really dangerous if somebody has the power to convince people to do that. Yeah, it is. That's very and, dark. And, and I, I fear... With what we see going on now, as everything seems to degenerate into the lowest common denominator, uh, people aren't thinking for themselves. They're being enraged over trivia and striking out, no longer just screaming at their neighbors, but actually striking out with an idea of hurting people. And I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why we can't have civil discourse, why somebody has to end up dead at the end of it. Very true. And of course, I'm sure you are referring to all the tragic events that have been going on as they're plastered all over our TV screens and computer screens, wherever you get your news from. Yes. Uh, our problems with guns in America, it's a very real well, you know, reality, in my you know, opinion. Guns aren't the problem. They're a symptom of the problem. Well, that's true. I was just going to say, it's not exactly the gun's fault, but those yeah. who are behind the guns, and again, I, I want to state that I'm not anti-gun, I'm just uh, baffled that today, in today's society, uh, if you have kids, you have to worry about them actually being shot. That's actually reality. Uh, yeah. But the, 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 the problem with the calls for gun control is they do not look at the root cause. The root yeah. cause is not the gun. True. 
it's the attitudes of people, and you see it all the time now, the anger that's building. I'm with you, yes. And, and it does have a mental health component. It is influenced by video games. It is influenced by movies. Um, you think it's, it's influenced by video the games? Problem, and they, can't, they, they don't want to deal with the components. They think if we can ban the guns, the problem will end. Well, if you ban the guns, then they're going to be driving trucks into people. It wasn't some. Wasn't there a case in California just the other day where a guy killed four people with a knife? Yes, he did. And in London, they're banding banding knives now, so you can't have a knife. Wow, that's in, <laughs> yeah. that's interesting. I didn't hear that. Um, How do you cut your bread? I'm gonna have to talk to uh, Katie Hopkins again here. And uh, it just it's just getting ridiculous. And and the politicians are doing nothing. They're blaming everybody else. And they say, well, you we have to have gun control. No, you have to have people control here. That's true. Yes. You've got to teach people how to act civilly. Why didn't we have this problem in the 1950s when some of us were growing up? <laughs> yeah, Mike? yeah. I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> well, it takes me. It, what happened back earlier in the 50s and the 1900s beginning? You know, back then people were not uh, so set uh, and uh, financially set. You know, people had to pretty much think straight in order to get by. And now they don't. Uh, so <laughs> Good many point. people live off welfare and uh, food stamps and, uh, you know, Social Security and government this, government that, you know. There's so many people who make <laughs> living so easily that, that I now make... they can just think anything they want. Well, some of us do, yeah. <laughs> I, I live on Social Security, basically. You know, not that doesn't change me. I'm, I'm a realist, period. I'm not a skeptic. I'm a realist. And uh, what I see is a change in American thinking from way back when my grandfather grew up. You know, people just don't understand what bias is. It's an emotional concept that says, you know, me, 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 you know. And, uh, you know, if people just could see that bias is, is behind all this stuff now, people are allowed to think with bias now when they didn't used to. Uh, back when you used to make a living with your with your hands, when you – you know, especially two or three hundred years ago, if you if you made a wrong decision, a biased decision, it could kill you, or at least destroy your life. And now you can make a biased decision, and uh, everybody thinks you're great. Well, it depends on your biased decision. There may be people attacking you for your decision. Well, of course, my bias I'm talking about in general here. Now, but I it, just I do not get uh, how we can get to the point we've gotten to without people understanding that uh, the trouble is generated by um, manipulated, manipulated thought and people not thinking critically. And a news media that um, uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, tell us the truth anymore. We used to be able to believe the truth and news media would tell the truth and, and now we can look at it um, and, we, and you can point to any number of examples of how the news media has twisted a story around to make it look bad. And the one, the one that I springs to my mind is uh, President Trump had snubbed a little boy uh, at, at, at some event, and they showed the videotape of Trump kind of ignoring the little boy. And then you get the rest of the tape, and he'd spent five minutes talking to the kid mm -hmm. uh, earlier on, and as he was leaving, he just left. And I, I'm convinced that if if Trump said oxygen was good, there'd be all kinds of people saying, no, no, it's a corrosive thing. We've got to get rid of it. Mm. Or he runs, he pulls people out of a burning building and, and the idea would be Trump flees buildings. And we can look <laughs> at it from all kinds of points of view. And I just, I just don't get, get it. And people are just not thinking. Anymore. Yes, yeah, it's, it's that's true. That's what I mean by bias. Yeah, there you they know, are bias. bias. A very, very simple word. But in my opinion, that's exactly what's the problem. On any side, that's exactly what it is. And that's, but, an, you know, bias is emotion. People are just thinking with emotion instead of thinking with reality. Good point. Well, we can sit here, we can sit here, and I, I've been in UFO conferences and things where you couldn't sit around and talk to one another rationally and civilly and have diametrically opposed opinions. Somebody I'm so, would get I'm, I'm so glad you're saying that because that's something I was going to eventually make the point of in terms of, you know, the individuals that all three of us talk to, uh, a, a lot of these individuals claim to be open-minded. They, they like to say that they're open-minded until you start to actually challenge their beliefs. And then that sort of notion goes out the window. And that's when they get violent and want to argue and do all kinds of stuff. 
Well, I've been in a number of conversations where people will ask me questions about what my opinion is, and they're not interested in what my opinion is. They're interested in me validating their belief structure. 100% true. So, so yeah. it's kind of like the question, what do you think of Colonel Corso? Well, there'd be a lot of people who would want me to say, yeah, what a great guy. You know, just really at the forefront of ufology when he was basically a um, fraud. No, that was an alley-oop, the, the way I uh, asked you there <laughs> about <laughs> that gentleman. But yes, you know, I'm glad we're having this discussion. I think it's incredibly vital that everyone hears this to be honest and not fabricate any experiences. How many times have all three of us have walked into a, a UFO convention and you hear the various speakers and you know the stories are fabricated. Uh, yep. you, you know, they're, they're, they're just, they're, they're lying. A lot of these people yes. are p putting one over. They're, they're working the crowd, as they say, in the business. Yep. I've got a lot of personal experience in that. <laughs> That's hilarious. A lot of personal experience in that. Yeah, you know, I've got a story to tell about that. Even. Yeah, go ahead. Well, one of them is that, you know, I used to speak on the circuit. We used to speak at this place uh, or, or through this uh, association called Whole Life Expo. And uh, in in California, uh, I can't remember what part of California, but we were there at a, a big conference, and I was asked to, to be on the panel, you know, before the whole audience. It's where people are able to advertise their particular workshops or whatever. And, uh, you know, you're supposed to speak for five minutes. Well, I spoke for my five minutes. And when I looked down there at all these other people in line, there's like a dozen of them. And I, and I realized, looking at them, that uh, almost all of those people were fabricators. Uh, and I knew that just on a, on a gut level for the most part. And then, of course, on a, <laughs> on a logical level. But I kind of made comments in that. That the fact they did make comments during that uh, particular five minutes up at the microphone that uh, you have to you have to you know I, I guess in a way I kind of threw it back on everybody there on the panel that uh, they shouldn't believe everything just because people say it you know, people yeah. make up anything and so uh, a week later we were in New York okay and and I expected I would be on the panel there guess what I wasn't invited mm. <laughs> but I sat in the audience. And every single one of those people got up and said things like, and it was almost the same words, really. Don't just believe us because of what we say. And, and they pretty much disqualified themselves, you know, in, in that respect. That's true. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was that, amazed that's, by that. I'm, because, yeah. You know, <laughs> it, you know, I'm glad you said that, by the way. Uh, a big thing that you mentioned here is the lack of discernment and the fact that yeah. these people... Uh, most of these people, they don't do that. No, they don't. It's sad. It's really sad. It, it is sad. Yeah, I mean, again, it, it's one of the reasons what stopped me and, and made me step back uh, to really not return to any of these conferences because I was getting invited to a lot of these places, not to talk, but just to go. And uh, seeing a lot of these people I've interviewed and talked to them in person, that's always nice and all that. But when you go in there and you're surrounded by all these other people and you're hearing uh, various speakers and you can't help but you can't help but discern some of their stories right there and then. And you kind of already know who's blowing smoke up your you know what? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's pretty it's pretty unusual that there's so many individuals who just buy into everything. Hook, line and sinker. Oh, I'm yeah. Sure <laughs> Once again. Buy everything, and the, that, and they they now think of me as a skeptic, and I'm not a skeptic, <laughs> but that's what they think. Go ahead, Kevin. Why? You you guys are handling it beautifully. Ah, I thought you were going to jump in. No. Ah, okay. No, I, I I was about to say once again that mantra of the X Files poster. I want to believe. Uh -huh. uh, it fulfills people's need for um, a fantastic explanation, one that they can romanticize. Uh, you know, the secret space program and that we've been out on Mars for a hundred years and uh, people are, after they do their service, regressed back to childhood so that they can, you know, go back to Earth and have a normal lifespan. I can't even say what I think about some of this stuff on the airwaves because <laughs> the FCC would not like it. But as, as the great P.T. Barnum used to say, there's a sucker born every minute. Uh, in this case, though, 
you know, visualize the wonderful Leonard Nimoy playing the great Mr. Spock, eyebrow raised, you know, foot in the air, stroking his chin, fascinating captain, um, that human beings can be such dummies or fall into these fairy tales um, and embrace them. You know, for me, the idea of a secret space program, okay, you know, um, we, we start with the uh, the Mercury astronauts who I hear are worshipped as a little boy. I wasn't into sports, but I knew everything about everything about those amazing seven guys. And let's say the program progressed and that every shot um, of a satellite, once they got rolling, was not reported to the American people because it was considered a matter of national security here, putting up a, a intelligence satellite. That is a secret space program. I get it. But when you tell me um, that, again, you know, we have bases on Mars for 50 years and uh, in the rings of Saturn, I remember something that the great Judge Judy said, and I think I can say this on the air, um, don't pee on my leg and mm -hmm. tell me it's raining. You know, one of the funniest things I've heard was one of, uh, one of the people I was interviewing by the name of Robert David Steele, who made headlines as well uh, for all the wrong reasons. He said that there was a... Uh, a colony on Mars, and they were sex trafficking slaves up there. Oh. Uh, yeah, he caught the attention of NASA and all kinds well, of individuals after gosh. that. Well, you know, you you guy guys up there with needs, and you know, it's. Um, I guess I, I guess that's what's going on out there on Mars. It's, it's a rough world. Oh uh, my goodness! World. You remember George Dempsey, don't you? George Definitely. Dempsey. Well, not personally. Yeah. Well, I met him. Had talked to him a bit. Anyway. Uh, his idea was that, that the backside of the moon was lush and green and lots of water and there's all kinds of people there and uh, society and all that. And that was before we'd gone to the moon, you know. And once we had seen the backside of the moon, none of that was there. So that's direct confirmation that somebody was just flat fabricating. Yeah, it's sad. And of course, we are coming to a close here very soon. But before we do, there is another thing that happened most recently involving Bernie Sanders. And I'm not quite sure oh, you yeah. could. Oh, yes. I'm sure you guys maybe know about this, but he appeared on the very popular talk show of one Joe Rogan. And uh, I don't really listen to the show, but someone sent me a clip of that. And uh, Bernie Sanders was promising that if elected, he would uh, reveal UFO secrets and it seemed like he was basically taking a, a play or a page from the playbook of one Hillary and Bill Clinton, who many, many years ago, I learned that Bill Clinton was supposed to be the quote unquote, a disclosure president, but was stonewalled. <laughs> and of course, I'm getting this information. Well, where I heard this from uh, is from uh, Stephen Bassett directly, who I was talking to many, many moons ago here. And that's where that information comes from, for those that are wondering. I think it's all political hype. It might be. But you have yeah. to remember Jimmy Carter promised the same thing. <laughs> yes. And um, some of the other presidents have been ta have talked about UFOs. Truman was very annoyed at the Washington Nationals in 1952. So the idea that... The, and Barack Obama had talked about this as well. So, uh, And John Podesta... He's um, he was uh, was chief of staff for Bill Clinton, and he was the campaign manager for Hillary, and that came up in their campaigns as well. They were going to release all the information, but they've never done it. Well, what better so, way to get elected? Well, I think the, the yeah the the UFO community is such a strong voting block that you need to get them in your pocket. That was a little humor, guys. Jeez. I, yeah. <laughs> I had myself um, muted. The UFO community uh, amounts to something like 60, 70 percent of everybody, doesn't it? No, I think it's about six or seven people. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, the point simply is we've gone through this before. Some candidate will come out and talk about, uh, I'll release the UFO information, and it never happens. There's been some talk because of the recent stuff with the Tic Tac and the information that has been blowing out from the government that maybe disclosure is getting a bit closer. Yes. Uh, but it seems to cool off a little bit in the last couple of weeks. It has. Not not much chatter going on around that. Well, well I, 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 the, program, the Nevada intrusion has, has kind of pushed that aside. 
I think that uh, disclosure or what we call disclosure will work its way to the surface one way or another. I think what will not happen, not ever, is that any leading elected official of the United States government, be it the current president, certainly none of the past presidents or the next president, will voluntarily release information. There is too much embarrassment for the secrets having been kept so long. The fact that every American president, left, right, conservative, progressive, is an unindicted co-conspirator in the greatest cover-up in history, and that one, maybe one of the things that we're embarrassed, we, the government of the United States at the deepest levels where this has been studied for decades, are embarrassed at how little we actually have come to learn or understand about the nature of this phenomena. Of course, that it could all end tomorrow when one lands uh, outside the uh, Pentagon. Bada bing, you got it. That'll end the discussion believe- right there. Oh, yeah. That I'm would- not sure that would even be believed. You don't think so. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, it would trend number one on Twitter. Well, he's got a point there. It would definitely trend. And of course, I do want to thank all of you for being a part of the program here. We are coming to a close. So one by one, we will let you guys go here. And of course, I want to start with you, Kevin. Okay. I want, you. Yeah, I want to thank you so much, my friend, for being a part of the program. It's been a great time, and I liked having you here. We definitely have to bring you back on the program. And uh, Kevin, go ahead and plug anything you'd like before we let you go. Well, I, there were a couple of things I'd like to say. Go uh, ahead. First of all, I think the people interested in the Roswell case should take a look at Roswell in the 21st century. I think there's mm-hmm. like a thousand footnotes in it. Mm-hmm. So it's well sourced. Uh, the book on Socorro Encounters in the Desert, I think, is kind of the antithesis of the Roswell book, where I'm saying, I don't know so much, and the Socorro book is, yeah, here's some really good information that suggests yeah. that uh, Lonnie Zamora saw a uh, flying saucer. Um, I do a blog at www.kevinrendell.blogspot.com that you can access anytime, and I do a radio program on the Exome Broadcast Network, and uh, every time the show is... We record a show, a link to it is on the blog, so you can you can listen to the show that way. So there's a lot of stuff out there. The blog is like 3,000 pages of free information. I don't charge, there's no donation requirement. You can read what you want, you can comment on it. If I don't like your comment, which means it was mean-spirited and it says <laughs> bad things about me, uh, it'll never see the light of day. <laughs> Amazing, well, thank you so much, Kevin. It's been a tremendous honor and pleasure to have you here. I appreciate that. And I'd like to thank Peter for all the nice things he said about me. I really appreciate that, too. Uh (laughs) All right. All right, my friend. We'll talk to you again on the other side. Okay. Good 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 night. night. And uh, there he goes, ladies and gentlemen. That was the one and only Kevin Randall. And, of course, we now are left with Mr. Peter Robbins and uh, Mike Rogers. And, Peter, we'll go with you. Um, Thank you for uh, giving me a chance to... Uh, share this time with you guys. Uh, we really did cover an awful lot of territory. That was a lot. Um, I just wanted to say that um, if any of you uh, listening can make it to um, beautiful Exeter, New Hampshire, um, a an exquisite New England town that has a right to um, claim two very important uh, UFO events, Um, We are going to be having our annual UFO conference and festival, uh, the Labor Day weekend coming up at the end of this month and the first day of September. Uh, I am a very proud co-founder of that event. We've got a terrific speakers lineup. Um, It's one of the most moderately priced UFO conferences for what you get in the country. Uh, It's a chance to see a magnificent part of the United States. It's very informal. And all you need to do is Google um, uh, Exeter UFO Festival and Conference, and you get the information, and I hope I'll get to see some of your listeners there. Very nice. Once again, Mr. Peter Robbins, I want to thank you tremendously for being a part of the program. Always an honor and pleasure uh, to talk to you too, my friend. Glad to, and um, wishing both you and Mike a terrific evening and uh well the evening's pretty much shot a great sunday yes sir mahalo to you 
Day. And we'll Bye, talk guys. again. Bye-bye. And there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, that was the one and only Peter Robbins. And of course, now we are left with the one and only Mike Rogers. What's going on, Mike? Well, I don't have a book to push. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Jennifer Stein earlier. Uh, several people did. Yeah. Uh, everybody, I guess. Uh, I would just like to say that she is uh, very much uh, a friend. And uh, she has put an awful lot of effort and money into, into making this film, which is now called Alien Abduction. And, of course, it's available on Amazon and a few other places. And she, you know, she it's an award-winning film. And um, I'd just like to mention that. As for myself, if anybody wants to know the details that we didn't really get into uh, concerning uh, the Phoenix Lights revelation and the documentation that is all there, uh, they can get it for free from me uh, on my uh, email site, which is uh, just, just contact me and I can send it to you which is M-H-R-O-D-E-R-S, uh, Rogers without a D, M-H-Rogers70 at gmail.com. And uh, do that, and I'll, I'll send the whole thing to you. Very nice. And, of course, Mike, I'll put that up on my website so people can uh, read some of your findings as well, as well. Yes, thank you. Yes, no problem. Thank you so much for being here too, my friend. And I'll talk to you again very soon. All right. All right, Mike. Take care and be safe out there. Very well. All right. Bye-bye. Same to you. Yes, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there he goes, ladies and gentlemen. That was the one and only Mike Rogers. He's always great to talk to. And, of course, want to thank all them again, Mr. Peter Robert Robbins and, and Kevin Randall. All three were great. And, of course, Mr. Mike Rogers, who you just heard right now, all fantastic. I thought that was an amazing discussion. And of course, as we wind down here, I did want to mention just one news bit here for you. And I thought it was pretty, pretty funny, to be honest. That, of course, comes from Kid Rock in the news again, boys and girls. He's been enjoying his most recent run-in with the media, or should I say all his most recent run-ins with the media as of late. I'm not sure if he's still wearing those repulsive red pants and that wife beater anymore. Uh, you know, the ones he used to parade around all the time with. Ah, yes, the good old days. I don't think I've seen anyone wear red dickies since. Our boy made the headlines, but this time, it's because of uh, Taylor Swift, of all people. This uh, news article says Trump supporter. They have quotation marks around that. Wow. Kid Rock claims Taylor Swift only wants to be a Democrat, to be in movies. And, uh, well, that's not exactly all he said. That's right. He basically suggested she would perform oral sex to get more starring roles. And of course, people on social media lost their minds. They lost their minds over Kid Rock. I mean, it's Kid Rock for God's sakes. Ah, yes. As you can see, our boy is not holding back. He's never, you know, he never was someone who held back. And if you recall many, many moons ago, he also went after a Tommy Lee. Yeah, I know. That's really nothing to be impressed by, a Tommy Lee. Uh, getting knocked out by his own son these days. Good Lord. And this is what he said exactly, and I quote, and it looks like she will suck the doorknob off Holly Weird to get there. Oldest move in the book. Good luck, girl. Kid Rock. Vicious with his tweet. It caused a big fecal storm, and people, of course, wanted Kid Rock's head. And that new story comes from the one and only Kid Rock providing us that entertainment there, fighting with Taylor Swift. Who would have saw that one coming? And as we take it home here tonight, I want to thank Mike Rogers, Peter Robbins yet again, and Mr. Kevin Randall. And I'd like to thank all of you in the chat room as well. It's been a fun time. Much respect to everyone who listens to the program. And on the replay, thank you to those at the Fringe FM and Deprogrammed Radio. I will return next week. And of course, I want to push the Patreon page to all of you. If you are a hardcore listener, definitely sign up for the Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Michael Deacon. You can hear all sorts of exclusive content coming to you very, very soon. Only one episode up currently right now. But that's a very vital episode that I want all of you to hear. It's the history of this program. And, the, and like Kid Rock, I hold nothing back in that episode. 
That's patreon.com forward slash Michael Deacon. International listeners out there, thank you so much for your support as well. Stay safe, everyone. And with that said, the world is a mysterious place, and life itself is a mystery. Until next time, good night, everybody.